Dedication, Prelude, Prologue, and Scene 1 of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part 1, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Bayard Taylor. Dedication. Again ye come, ye hovering forms. I find ye as early to my clouded sight ye shone. Shall I attempt this once to seize and bind ye? Still, O oh, my heart, is that illusion thrown? Ye crowd more near. Then be the rain assigned ye, and sway me from your misty shadowy zone. My bosom thrills with youthful passion shaken, for a magic airs that round your march awaken. Of joyous days ye bring the blissful vision, the dear familiar phantoms rise again, and, like an old and half-extinct tradition, first love returns with friendship in his train. Renewed is pain, with mournful repetition, life tracks his devious labyrinthine chain, and names the good whose cheating fortune tore them from happy hours, and left me to deplore them. They hear no longer these succeeding measures, the souls to whom my earliest songs I sang, Dispersed the friendly troop with all its pleasures, And still, alas, the echoes first that rang. I bring the unknown multitude my treasures, Their very plaudits give my heart a pang. And those beside, whose joy my song is flattered, If still they live, wide through the world are scattered. And grasps me now a long, unwanted yearning For that serene and solemn spirit-land, my song to faint Aeolian murmurs turning, Sways like a harp-string by the breezes fanned. I thrill and tremble, tear on tear is burning, And the stern heart is tenderly unmanned. What I possess I see far distant lying, And what I lost grows real and undying. Prelude at the Theatre You two, who oft a helping hand have lent, in need and tribulation. Come, let me know your expectation of this our enterprise in German land. I wish the crowd to feel itself well treated, especially since it lives and lets me live. The posts are set, the booth of boards completed, and each awaits the banquet I shall give. Already there, with curious eyebrows raised, they sit sedate, and hope to be amazed. I know how, one, the people's taste may flatter, yet here a huge embarrassment I feel. What they're accustomed to is no great matter, but then, alas, they've read an awful deal. How shall we plan that all be fresh and new, important matter, yet attractive too? For tis my pleasure to behold them surging, when to our booth the current sets apace, and with Tremendous oft-repeated urging squeeze onward through the narrow gate of grace. By daylight, even, they push and cram in to reach the cellar's box, a fighting host, and, as for bread around a baker's door in famine, to get a ticket break their necks almost. This miracle alone can work the poet on men so various. Now, my friend, pray show it. Speak not to me of yonder motley masses, Whom but to see puts out the fire of song. Hide from my view the surging crowd that passes, And in its whirlpool forces us along. No, lead me where some heavenly silence glasses, The purer joys that round the poet throng, Where love and friendship still divinely fashion The bonds that bless, the wreaths that crown his passion. Ah, every utterance from the depths of feeling The timid lips have stammeringly expressed, Now failing, now perchance success revealing, Gulps the wild moment in its greedy breast. Or oft reluctant years its warrant sealing, Its perfect stature stands at last confessed. What dazzles for the moment spends its spirit, What's genuine shall posterity inherit. Posterity? Don't name the word to me. If I should choose to preach posterity, where would you get contemporary fun? That men will have it, there's no blinking. A fine young fellow's presence, to my thinking, is something worth to every one, who genially his nature cannot pour takes from the people's moods no irritation. The wider circle he acquires, the more securely works his inspiration. 
then pluck apart and give us sterling coin let fancy be with her attendants fitted sense reason sentiment and passion join but have a care lest folly be omitted chiefly enough of incident prepare they come to look and they prefer to stare reel off a host of threads before their faces so that they gape in stupid wonder then by sheer diffuseness you have won their graces and are at once most popular of men only by mass you touch the mass for any will finally himself his bit select who offers much brings something unto many and each goes home content with the effect if you've a piece why just in pieces give it a hash a stew will bring success believe it tis easily displayed and easy to invent what use a whole compactly to present your hearers pick and pluck as soon as they receive it you do not feel how such a trade debases how ill it suits the artist proud and true the botching work each fine pretender traces is i perceive a principle with you such a reproof not in the least offends a man who some result intends must use the tools that best are fitting reflect soft wood is given to you for splitting and then observe for whom you write if one comes bored exhausted quite another satiate leaves the banquet tapers and worst of all full many a white is fresh from reading of the daily papers idly to us they come as to a masquerade mere curiosity their spirits warming the ladies with themselves and with their finery aid without a salary their parts performing what dreams are yours in high poetic places you're pleased forsooth full houses to behold draw near and view your patrons faces the half are coarse the half are cold one when the play is out goes home to cards a wild knight on a wench's breast another chooses why should you rack poor foolish bards for ends like these the gracious muses i tell you give but more more ever more they ask thus shall you hit the mark of gain and glory seek to confound your auditory to satisfy them is a task what ails you now is it suffering or pleasure go find yourself a more obedient slave what shall the poet that which nature gave the highest right supreme humanity forfeit so wantonly to swell your treasure whence o'er the heart his empire free the elements of life how conquers he is not his heart's accord urged outward far and dim to wind the world in unison with him when on the spindle spun to endless distance by nature's listless hand the thread is twirled and the discordant tones of all existence in sullen jangle are together hurled who then the changeless order of creation divides and kindles into rhythmic dance who brings the one to join the general ordination where it may throb in grandest consonance who bids the storm to passion stir the bosom in brooding souls the sunset burn above who scatters every fairest april blossom along the shining path of love who braids the noteless leaves to crowns requiting desert with fame in actions every field who makes olympus sure the gods uniting the might of man as in the bard revealed so these fine forces in conjunction propel the high poetic function as in a love adventure they might play you meet by accident you feel you stay and by degrees your heart is tangled bliss grows apace and then its course is jangled you're ravished quite then comes a touch of woe and there's a neat romance completed ere you know let us then such a drama give grasp the exhaustless life that all men live each shares therein, though few may comprehend, where'er you touch, there's interest without end. In motley pictures little light, much error, and of truth a glimmering might, thus the best beverage is supplied, whence all the world is cheered and edified. 
Then, at your play, behold the fairest flower of youth collect, to hear the revelation, each tender soul, with sentimental power, sucks melancholy food from your creation, and now in this, now that, the leaven works, and each beholds what in his bosom lurks. They still are moved at once to weeping, or to laughter, still wonder at your flights, enjoy the show they see. A mind once formed is never suited after, one yet in growth will ever grateful be. Then give me back that time of pleasures, while yet in joyous growth I sang, when, like a fount, the crowding measures uninterrupted gushed and sprang. Then bright mist veiled the world before me, in opening buds a marvel woke, as I the thousand blossoms broke which every valley richly bore me. I nothing had and yet enough for youth, joy in illusion, ardent thirst for truth, Give unrestrained the old emotion, the bliss that touched the verge of pain, the strength of hate, love's deep devotion. Oh, give me back my youth again. Youth, good my friend, you certainly require. When foes in combat sorely press you, when lovely maids in fond desire hang on your bosom and caress you. When from the hard-worn gold wreath beckons afar, the race awaiting. When after dancing out your breath you pass the night in dissipating. But the familiar harp with soul to play, with grace and bold expression, and towards a self-erected goal, to walk with many a sweet digression. This, aged sirs, belongs to you, and we no less revere you for that reason. Age childish makes, they say, but tis not true. We're only genuine children still, in age's season. The words you've bandied are sufficient. Tis deeds that I prefer to see. In compliments you're both proficient, but might the while more useful be. What's need to talk of inspiration? Tis no companion of delay. If poetry be your vocation, let poetry your will obey. Full well you know what here is wanting. The crowd for strongest drink is panting, and such forthwith I'd have you brew. What's left undone to-day, to-morrow, will not do. Waste not a day in vain digression. With resolute, courageous trust, seize every possible impression, and make it firmly your possession. You'll then work on, because you must. Upon our German stage, you know it, each tries his hand at what he will. So take of traps and scenes your fill, and all you find be sure to show it. Use both the great and lesser heavenly light. Squander the stars in any number, beasts, birds, trees, rocks, and all such lumber, fire, water, darkness, day and night. Thus in our booth's contracted sphere the circle of creation will appear and move as we deliberately impel from heaven across the world to hell. Prologue in Heaven The three archangels come forward. The sun orb sings in emulation, mid brother spheres his ancient frown, his path predestined through creation, he ends with step of thunder sound. The angels from his vigid splendid draw power whose measure none can say. The lofty works uncomprehended are bright as on the earliest day. And swift, and swift beyond conceiving, the splendor of the world goes round, day's Eden brightness still relieving the awful night's intense profound. The ocean tides in foam are breaking against the rock's deep bases hurled, and both, the spheric race partaking, eternal, swift, are onward whirled. And rival storms abroad are surging, From sea to land, from land to sea, A chain of deepest action Forging round all in wrathful energy. There flames a desolation, Blazing before the thunder's crashing way. Yet, Lord, thy messengers are praising The gentle movement of thy day. Though still by them uncomprehended, from these the angels draw their power, and all thy works sublime and splendid are bright as in creation's hour. Since thou, O Lord, 
deigns to approach again and ask us how we do in manner kindest, and heretofore to meet myself with fame among thy menials now my face thou findest. Pardon, this troop I cannot follow after, with lofty speech, though by them scorned and spurned, my pathos certainly would move thy laughter, if thou hadst not all merriment unlearned. Of suns and walls I have nothing to be quoted, how men torment themselves is all I have noted. The little god of the wall sticks to the same old way, and is as whimsical as on creation's day. Life somewhat better might content him, but for the gleam of heavenly light which thou hast lent him. He calls it reason. Thence his power is increased to be far beastlier than any beast. Saving thy gracious presence, he to me, a long-legged grasshopper, appears to be. That springing flies and flying springs, and in the grass the same old ditty sings. Would he still lay among the grass he grows in? Each bit of dung he seeks to stick his nose in. Hast thou then nothing more to mention? Comest ever thus with ill intention? Find'st nothing right on earth eternally? No, Lord, I find things there still bad as they can be. Man's misery even to pity moves my nature. I have scars the heart to plague the wretched creature. Knowst Faust? The doctor Faust. My servant, he. Forsooth, he serves you after strange devices. No earthly meat or drink the full suffices. His spirit is form and fire spirit, half conscious of his frenzied crazed unrest. The fairest stars from heaven he required, from art the highest raptures and the best, and all the near and far that he desired fails to subdue the tumult of his breast. Though still confused his service unto me, I soon shall lead him to a clearer morning. Sees not the gardener, even while buds his tree, both flower and fruit the future years adorning? What will you bet? There is still a chance to gain him, if unto me full leave you give, gently upon my road to train him. As long as he on earth shall live, so long I make no prohibition. While man's desires and aspirations stir, he cannot choose but err. My thanks. I find the dead no acquisition, and never care to have them in my keeping. I much prefer the chicks where ruddy blood is leaping, and when a corpse approaches close my house, it goes with me as with the cap the mouse. Enough. What thou hast asked is granted. Turn off this spirit from his fountainhead. To trap him, let thy snares be planted, and him with thee be downward led. Then stand abashed when thou art forced to say, A good man, through obscurest aspiration, has still an instinct of the one true way. Agreed, but it is a short probation. About my bet I feel no trepidation. If I fulfill my expectation, he will let me triumph with a swelling breast. Dust shall he eat, and with a chest, as did a certain snake, my near relation. Therein thou art free according to thy merits. The like of thee have never moved my hate. Of all the bold denying spirits, the waggish knave least trouble doth create. Man's active nature flagging seats too soon the level, unqualified repose he learns to crave. Whence willingly the comrade him I gave, who works, excites, and must create as devil. But ye gods, sons in love and duty, enjoy the rich, the everlasting beauty. 
creative power that works eternal schemes, clasp you in bonds of love, relaxing never, and what in wavering apparition gleams, fix in its place with thoughts that stand forever. Heaven closes. The archangels separate. Solus. I like at times to hear the ancient's word, and have a care to be most civil. It is really kind of such a noble lord, so humanly to gossip with the devil. First part of the tragedy. One. Night. A lofty arched narrow gothic chamber. Faust, in a chair at his desk, restless. I've studied now philosophy, and jurisprudence, medicine, and even, alas, theology, from end to end with labor keen, and here, poor fool, with all my lore, I stand no wiser than before. I'm magister, yea, doctor height, and straight or crosswise, wrong or right, these ten years long, with many woes, I've led my scholars by the nose, and see that nothing can be known. That knowledge cuts me to the bone. I'm cleverer, true, than those fops of teachers, doctors and magisters, scribes and preachers. Neither scruples nor doubts come now to smite me, nor hell nor devil can longer affright me. For this all pleasure am I foregoing. I do not pretend to aught worth knowing, I do not pretend I could be a teacher to help or convert a fellow creature. Then, too, I've neither lands nor gold, nor the world's least pomp or honor hold. No dog would endure such a cursed existence. Wherefore, from magic I seek assistance, that many a secret perchance I reach through spirit power and spirit speech, and thus the bitter task forego of saying things I do not know, that I may detect the inmost force which binds the world and guides its course, its germs, productive powers explore, and rummage in empty words no more. O oh, full and splendid moon, whom I have from this desk seen climb the sky so many a midnight, would thy glow for the last time beheld my woe? Ever thine eye, most mournful friend, O'er books and papers saw me bend. But would that I on mountains grand Amid thy blessed light could stand, With spirits through mountain caverns hover, Float in thy twilight the meadows over, And, freed from the fumes of lore that swathe me, To health in thy dewy fountains bathe me. Ah, me! This dungeon still I see, this drear accursed masonry, where even the welcome daylight strains but duskly through the painted panes, hemmed in by many a toppling heap of books, worm-eaten, grey with dust, which to the vaulted ceiling creep against the smoky paper thrust, with glasses, boxes round me stacked, and instruments together hurled, ancestral lumber stuffed and packed, such is my world, and what a world! And do I ask wherefore my heart falters, oppressed with unknown needs? Why some inexplicable smart all movement of my life impedes? Alas, in living nature's stead, where God his human creature set, in smoke and mould the fleshless dead and bones of beasts surround me yet. Fly! Up and seek the broad, free land, and this one book of mystery from Nostradamus's very hand. Is it not sufficient, company, when I the starry courses know, and nature's wise instruction seek, with light of power my soul shall glow, as when to spirits spirits speak. Tis vain this empty brooding here, though guessed the holy symbols be. You spirits come! You hover near. Oh, if you hear me, answer me. He opens the book and perceives the sign of the macrocosm. Ha! Huh, what a sudden rapture leaps from this I view, through all my senses swiftly flowing. 
I feel a youthful, holy, vital bliss in every vein and fibre newly glowing. Was it a god who traced this sign with calm across my tumult stealing, my troubled heart to joy unsealing with impulse mystic and divine, the powers of nature here around my path revealing? Am I a god? So clear mine eyes, in these pure features I behold creative nature to my soul unfold. What says the sage? Now first I recognize— the spirit world no closures fasten thy sense is shut thy heart is dead disciple up untiring hasten to bathe thy breast in morning red he contemplates the sign how each the whole its substance gives each in the other works and lives like heavenly forces rising and descending, their golden urns reciprocally lending, with wings that winnow blessing, from heaven through earth I see them pressing, filling the all with harmony unceasing. How grand a show! But ah, a show alone! Thee, boundless nature, how make thee my own? Where you, you beast, founts of all being shining, Whereon hang heaven's and earth's desire? Where to our withered hearts aspire? You flow, you feed, and am I vainly pining? He turns the leaves impatiently, and perceives the sign of the earth spirit. How otherwise upon me works this sign? Thou, spirit of the earth, art nearer. Even now my powers are loftier, clearer. I glow as drunk with new-made wine. New strength and heart to meet the world incite me. The woe of earth, the bliss of earth invite me. And though the shock of storms may smite me, no crash of shipwreck shall have power to fright me. Clouds gather over me. The moon conceals her light. The lamps extinguished. Mists rise. Red, angry rays are darting around my head. There falls a horror from the vaulted roof, and seizes me. I feel thy presence. Spirit, I invoke. Reveal thyself. Ha! In my heart what rending stroke! With new impulsion my senses heave in this convulsion. I feel thee draw my heart, absorb, exhaust me. Thou must, thou must, and though my life it cost me, he seizes the book and mysteriously pronounces the sign of the spirit. A ruddy flame flashes. The spirit appears in the flame. Who calls me? With averted head. Terrible to see! Me hast thou long with might attracted, Long from my sphere thy food extracted, And now... Woe! I endure not thee! To view me is thine aspiration, My voice to hear, my countenance to see. Thy powerful yearning moveth me, Here am I, what mean perturbation Thee superhuman shakes. Thy soul's high calling where? Where is the breast from which itself A world did bear, and shaped and cherished, with such joy expanded, to be our peer with us, the spirits banded. Where art thou, Faust, whose voice has pierced to me, who towards me pressed with all thine energy? He art thou, who, my presence breathing, seeing, trembles through all the depths of being, a writhing worm, a terror-stricken form? The form of flame shall I then fear? Yes, I am Faust, I am thy peer. In the tides of life, in action's storm, A fluctuant wave, a shuttle free, Birth and the grave, an eternal sea, A weaving, flowing life, all glowing, Thus at time's humming loom, tis my hand prepares the garment of life which the deity wears. Thou, who around the wide world wendest, 
thou busy spirit, how near I feel to thee! Thou art like the spirit which thou comprehendest, not me. Disappears, overwhelmed. Not thee! Whom, then? I, image of the Godhead, not even like thee. A knock. O oh, death! I know it. Tis my famulus. My fairest luck finds no fruition. In all the fullness of my vision, the soulless sneak disturbs me thus. Enter Wagner in dressing gown and nightcap, a lamp in his hand. Faust turns impatiently. Arden, I heard your declamation. Twas sure an old Greek tragedy you read. In such an art I crave some preparation since now it stands one in good stead. I've often heard it said a preacher might learn with a comedian for a teacher. Yes, when the priest comedian is by nature, as happily now and then the case may be. Ah, when one studies thus a prison creature, that scarce the world on holidays can see, scarce through a glass by rare occasion, how shall one lead it by persuasion? You'll ne'er attain it, save you know the feeling, save from the soul it rises clear, serene in primal strength, compelling the hearts and minds of all who hear. You sit forever gluing, patching, you cook the scraps from others' fare, and from your heap of ashes hatching a starveling flame you blow it bare. Take children's monkeys gaze admiring, if such your taste, and be content, but ne'er from heart to heart you'll speak inspiring, save your own heart is eloquent. Yet through delivery or to succeed, I feel that I am far behind indeed. Seek thou the honest recompense, beware a tinkling fool to be. With little art, clear wit and sense suggest their own delivery, and if thou art moved to speak in earnest, what need that after words thou yearnest? Yes, your discourses with their glittering show, where you for men twist shredded thought like paper, are unrefreshing as the winds that blow the rustling leaves through chill autumnal vapor. Ah, oh God, but art is long, and life, alas, is fleeting, and oft with zeal my critic duties meeting, in head and breast there's something wrong. How hard it is to compass the assistance! whereby one rises to the source, and haply, ere one travels half the course, must the poor devil quit existence. Is parchment, then, the holy font before thee, a draught wherefrom thy thirst forever slakes? No true refreshment can restore thee, save what from thine own soul spontaneous breaks. Pardon, a great delight is granted, when, in the spirit of the ages planted, we mark how, ere our times, a sage has thought, and then how far his work and grandly we have brought. Oh, yes, up to the stars at last. Listen, my friend, the ages that are past are now a book with seven seals protected. What you the spirit of the ages call is nothing but the spirit of you all, wherein the ages are reflected. So oftentimes you miserably mar it. At the first glance who sees it runs away, an awful barrel and a lumber garret, or at the best a punch and judy play, with maxims most pragmatical and hitting, as in the mouths of puppets are befitting. But then the world, the human heart and brain, of these one covets some slight apprehension. Yes, of the kind which men attain. Who dares the child's true name in public mention? The few who thereof something really learned, unwisely frank with hearts that spurned concealing, and to the mob laid bare each thought and feeling, have evermore been crucified and burned. I pray you, friend, tis now the dead of night. Our converse here must be suspended. I would have showed your watches with the light so that our learned talk might be extended. Tomorrow, though, I'll ask, in Easter leisure, this and the other question, at your pleasure. Most zealously I seek for erudition. 
Much do I know, but to know is all my ambition. Exit. Solus. That brain alone not loses hope, whose choice is to stick in shallow trash forevermore, which digs with eager hand for buried ore, and when it finds an angle worm, rejoices. Dare such a human voice disturb the flow around me here of spirit present fullest? And yet, this once my thanks I owe to thee, of all earth's sons the poorest, dullest. For thou hast torn me from that desperate state which threatens soon to overwhelm my senses. The apparition was so giant great, it dwarfed and withered all my soul's pretenses. I, image of the Godhead, who began deeming eternal truth secure in nearness. Ye choirs, have ye begun the sweet, consoling chant, which through the night of death the angels' ministrants sang, God's new covenant repeating? With spices and precious balm we arrayed him, faithful and gracious we tenderly laid him, linen to bind him, cleanly wound we, ah, when we would find him, Christ no more found we. Christ is ascended, bliss hath invested him, woes that molested him, trials that tested him, gloriously ended. Why, here in dust, entice me with your spell, ye gentle, powerful sounds of heaven? Peel rather there, where tender natures dwell. Your messages I hear, but faith has not been given. The dearest child of faith is miracle. I venture not to soar to yonder regions whence the glad tidings hither float. And yet from childhood up, familiar with the note, to life it now renews my old allegiance. Once heavenly love sent down a burning kiss upon my brow, in Sabbath silence holy, and filled with mystic presage chimed the church bell slowly, and prayer dissolved me in a fervent bliss. A sweet uncomprehended yearning drove forth my feet through woods and meadows free, and while a thousand tears were burning, I felt a world arise for me. These chants, to youth and all its sports appealing, proclaim the spring's rejoicing holiday, and memory holds me now, with childish feeling, back from the last, the solemn way. Sound on, ye hymns of heaven, so sweet and mild. My tears gush forth, the earth takes back her child. Has he, victoriously, burst from the vaulted grave and all gloriously, now sits exalted? Is he, in glow of birth, rapture created near? Ah, to the world of earth, still are we made here. We, his aspiring followers, him we miss. Weeping, desiring, Master, thy bliss. Christ is the risen. Out, out of corruption's womb. Burst ye the prison, break from your gloom, praising and pleading him, lovingly needing him, brotherly feeding him, preaching and speeding him, blessing succeeding him, thus is the master near, thus is he here. End of section. Scenes 2 and 3 of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part 1, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Bayard Taylor. 2. Before the city gate. Pedestrians of all kinds come forth. Why do you go that way? Wherefore the hunters lodge today? We'll saunter to the mill in yonder hollow. Go to the river tavern, I should say. But then it's not a pleasant way. And, and what, what will you? As goes the crowd, I follow. Come up to Bergdorf. There you'll find good cheer. The finest lasses and the best of beer. And jolly rows and squabbles, trust me. You swaggering fellow. 
is your hide a third time itching to be tried i won't go there your jolly rows disgust me no no i'll turn and go to town again we'll surely find him by those poplars yonder that's no great luck for me tis plain you'll have him when and where you wander his partner in the dance you'll be but what is all your fun to me he's surely not alone to-day he'll be with curly head i heard him say deuce how they step the bunks and winches come brother we must see them to the benches a strong old beer a pipe that stings and bites a girl in sunday clothes these three are my delight just see those handsome fellows there it's really shameful i declare to follow servant girls when they might have the most genteel society to-day to the first student not quite so fast two others come behind those dressed so prettily and neatly my neighbor's one of them i find a girl that takes my heart completely they go their way with looks demure but they'll accept us, after all, I'm sure. No, brother, not for me their formal ways. Quick, lest our game escape us in the press. The hand that wields the broom on Saturdays will best on Sundays fondle and caress. He suits me not at all, our new-made burgomaster. Since he's installed, his arrogance grows faster. How has he helped the town, I say? Things worsen. What improvement names he? Obedience more than ever claims he, And more than ever we must pay. Beggar sings. Good gentlemen and lovely lady, So red of cheek and fine of dress, Behold how needful here your aid is, And see enlighten my distress. Let me not vainly sing my ditty, He's only glad who gives away, A holiday that shows your pity, Shall be for me a harvest day. On Sundays, holidays, there's naught I take delight in, like gossiping of war and war's array, when down in Turkey far away the foreign people are a-fighting. One at the window sits with glass and friends, and sees all sorts of ships go down the river gliding, and blesses then as home he wends at night our times of peace abiding. Yes, neighbour, that's my notion too. Why, let them break their heads, let loose their passions, and mix things madly through and through. So, here, we keep our good old fashions. Old woman to the citizen's daughter. Dear me, how fine, so handsome and so young. Who wouldn't lose his heart that met you? Don't be so proud, I'll hold my tongue, and what you'd like I'll undertake to get you. Come, Agatha, I shun the witch's sight, before folks lest there be misgiving. "'Tis true she showed me on St. Andrew's night, my future sweetheart, just as he were living. "'She showed me mine in crystal clear, with several wild young blades, a soldier lover. "'I seek him everywhere, I pry and peer, and yet somehow his face I can't discover. "'Castles with lofty ramparts and towers, maidens disdainful in beauty's array, both shall be ours.' Bold is the venture, splendid the pay. Lads, let the trumpets for us be suing, calling to pleasure, calling to ruin. Stormy our life is, such is its boon. Maidens and castles capitulate soon. Bold is the venture, splendid the pay, and the soldiers go marching, marching away. Released from ice are brook and river, by the quickening glance of the gracious spring. The colors of hope to the valley cling, and weak old winter himself must shiver, withdrawn to the mountains, a crownless king. Whence ever retreating he sends again impotent showers of sleet that darkle in belts across the green of the plain. But the sun will permit no white to sparkle. Everywhere form in development moveth, He will brighten the world with the tints he loveth, And, lacking blossoms, blue, yellow, and red, He takes these gaudy people instead. Turn thee about, 
and from this height back on the town direct thy sight out of the hollow gloomy gate the motley throngs come forth elate each will the joy of the sunshine hoard to honor the day of the risen lord they feel themselves their resurrection from the low dark room scarce habitable from the bonds of work from trade's restriction from the pressing weight of roof and gable from the narrow crushing streets and alleys from the church's solemn and reverent night all come forth to the cheerful light how lively see the multitude sallies scattering through gardens and fields remote while over the river that broadly dallies dances so many a festive boat and over laden nigh to sinking the last full wherry takes the steam yonder afar from the hill paths blinking their clothes are colours that softly gleam i hear the noise of the village even here is the people's proper heaven here high and low contented see here i am man dare man to be to stroll with you sir doctor flatters tis honour profit unto me but i alone would shun these shallow matters since all that's coarse provokes my enmity this fiddling shouting tin-pin rolling i hate these noises of the throng they rave as satan were their sports controlling and call it mirth and call it song peasants under the linden tree dance and song all for the dance the shepherd dressed in ribbons wreath and gayest vest himself with care arraying around the linden less and lad already footed it like mad hurrah 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 ta -ra -la. the fiddle bow was playing he broke the ranks, no whit afraid, and with his elbow punched a maid who stood the dance surveying. The buxom when she turned and said, Now you I call a stupid head. Hurrah, 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 ta -ra -la. Be decent while you're staying. Then round the circle went their flight, they danced to left, they danced to right, their kirtles all were playing. They first grew red and then grew warm and rested panting arm in arm, hurrah, 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 ta -ra -la, and hips and elbows straying. Now don't be so familiar here, how many a one has fooled his dear, waylaying and betraying. And yet he coaxed her soon aside, and round the linden sounded wide, hurrah, 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 ta -ra, ra la and the fiddle bow was playing. Sir Doctor, it is good of you that thus you condescend to-day among this crowd of merry folk a high learned man to stray then also take the finest can we fill with fresh wine for your sake i offer it and humbly wish that not alone your thirst is slake that as the drops below its brink so many days of life you drink I take the cup you kindly reach with thanks and health to all and each. The people gather in a circle about him. In truth, tis well and fitly timed that now our day of joy you share, who wheretofore in evil days gave us so much of helping care. Still many a man stands living here, saved by your father's skilful hand, that snatched him from the fever's rage, and stayed the plague in all the land. Then also you, though but a youth, went into every house of pain. Many the corpses carried forth, but you in health came out again. No test or trial you evaded, a helping God the helper aided. Help to the man so skilled and tried, that for our help he low may abide. To him above bow down, my friends, who teaches help, 
and succor sends. He goes on with Wagner. With what a feeling, thou great man, must thou receive the people's honest veneration? How lucky he, whose gifts his station, with such advantages endow. Thou art shown to all the younger generation, each ask and presses near to gaze. The fiddle stops, the dance delays. Thou goest, they stand in rows to see, and all the caps are lifted high. A little more, and they would bend the knee, as if the holy host came by. A few more steps ascend, as far as yonder stone. Here from our wandering we will rest contented. Here, lost in thought, I've lingered oft alone, when foolish fasts and prayers my life tormented. Here, rich in hope and firm in faith, with tears, wrung hands, and sighs, I've striven the end of that far-spreading death, entreating from the Lord of heaven. Now, like contempt, the crowd's applauses seem. Couldst thou but read within mine inmost spirit, how little now I deem that sire or son such praises merit. My father's was a sombre, brooding brain, which through the holy spheres of nature groped and wandered, and honestly, in his own fashion, pondered with labor whimsical and pain, who in his dusky workshop bending with proved adepts in company, made from his recipes unending opposing substances agree. There was a lion red, a wooer daring, within the lily's tepid bath espoused, and both tormented then by flame unsparing, by turns in either bridal chamber housed. If then appeared with colors splendid the young queen in her crystal shell, this was the medicine. The patient's woes soon ended, and none demanded who got well. Thus we our hellish boluses compounding, Among these vales and hills surrounding, Worse than the pestilence have passed. Thousands were done to death from poison of my giving, And I must hear by all the living The shameless murderers praised at last. Why, therefore, yield to such depression? A good man does his honest share In exercising with the strictest care, the art bequeathed to his possession. Dost thou thy father honor as a youth? Then may his teaching cheerfully impel thee. Dost thou, as man, increase the stores of truth? Then may thine own son afterwards excel thee. O oh, happy he who still renews the hope from error's deeps to rise forever! That which one does not know one needs to use— and what one knows one uses never. But let us not by such despondence sow the fortune of this hour embitter. Mark how, beneath the evening sunlight's glow, the green embosomed houses glitter. The glow retreats, done is the day of toil, it yonder hastes new fields of life exploring. Ah, that no wing can lift me from the soil upon its track to follow, follow soaring. Then would I see eternal evening gild the silent world beneath me glowing, on fire each mountain peak, with peace each valley filled, the silver brook to golden rivers flowing. The mountain chain with all its gorges deep would then no more impede my godlike motion, and now before mine eyes expands the ocean with all its bays in shining sleep. Yet finally the weary god is sinking. The new-born impulse fires my mind. I hasten on, his beams eternal drinking, The day before me, and the night behind. Above me heaven unfurled, The floor of waves beneath me, A glorious dream! Though now the glories fade. Alas, the wings that lift the mind, No aid of wings to lift the body can bequeath me, Yet in each soul is born the pleasure of yearning onward, upward and away. When o'er our heads, lost in the vaulted azure, the lark sends down his flickering lay. When over crags and piny highlands the poising eagle slowly soars, and over plains and lakes and islands the crane sails by to other shores. 
I've had myself at times some odd caprices, but never yet such an impulse felt as this is. One soon fatigues on woods and fields to look, nor would I beg the bird his wing to spare us. How otherwise the mental raptures bear us from page to page, from book to book. Then winter nights take loveliness untold, as warmer life in every limb had crowned you. And when your hands unroll some parchment rare and old, all heaven descends and opens bright around you. One impulse art thou conscious of at best. Oh, never seek to know the other. Two souls, alas, reside within my breast, and each withdraws from and repels its brother. One with tenacious organs holds in love and clinging lust the world in its embraces. The other strongly sweeps this dust above into the high ancestral spaces. If there be airy spirits near, twixt heaven and earth on potent errands fleeing, let them drop down the golden atmosphere, and bear me forth to new and varied being. Yea, if a magic mantle once were mine, to waft me o'er the world at pleasure, I would not for the costliest stores of treasure, not for a monarch's robe, the gift resign. Invoke not thus the well-known throng, which through the firmament diffused is bearing, and danger thousandfold our race to wrong, in every quarter is preparing. Swift from the north the spirit fangs so sharp sweep down, and with their barbed points will assail you. Then from the east they come, to dry and warp your lungs, till breath and being fail you. If from the desert sendeth them the south, with fire on fire your throbbing forehead crowning, the west leads on a host to cure the drought, only one meadow, field, and you are drowning. They gladly hearken prompt for injury, gladly obey, because they gladly cheat us. From heaven they represent themselves to be, and lisp like angels when the lies they meet us. But let us go. Tis gray and dusky all. The air is cold, the vapors fall. At night one learns his house to prize. Why stand you this with such astonished eyes? What in the twilight can your mind so trouble? Seest thou the black dog coursing there, through corn and stubble? Long since, yet deemed him not important in the least. Inspect him close, for what takes thou the beast? Why, for a poodle who has lost his master, and sense about his track to find. Seest thou the spiral circles, narrowing faster, which he, approaching round us, seems to wind? A streaming trail of fire, if I see rightly, follows his path of mystery. It may be your eyes deceive you slightly. Not but a plain black poodle do I see. It seems to me that, with enchanted cunning, he snares our feet some future chain to bind. I see him timidly, in doubt, around us running, since in his master's stead two strangers doth he find. The circle narrows. He is near. A dog thou seest, and not a phantom here. Behold him stop, upon his belly crawl, his tail set wagging, canine habits all. Come, follow us, come here at least. Tis the absurdest, drollest beast. Stand still, and you will see him wait. Address him, and he gambles straight. If something's lost, he'll quickly bring it. Your cane, if in the stream, you fling it. No doubt you're right. No trace of mind, I own, is in the beast. I see but drill alone. The dog, when he's well educated, is by the wisest tolerated. Yes, he deserves your favor thoroughly. The clever scholar of the students he. They pass in the city gate. 3. The study. Faust. Entering with the poodle. Behind me, field and meadows sleeping, I leave in deep prophetic night, Within whose dread and holy keeping The better soul awakes to light. The wild desires no longer win us, The deeds of passion cease to chain, 
The love of man revives within us. The love of God revives again. Be still, thou poodle. Make not such racket and riot. Why at the threshold wilt snuffing be? Behind the stove repose thee in quiet. My softest cushion I give to thee. As thou up yonder, with running and leaping, Amused us hast on the mountain's crest, So now I take thee into my keeping, A welcome, but also a silent guest. Ah, when within our narrow chamber The lamp with friendly luster glows, Flames in the breast each faded ember, And in the heart itself that knows. Then hope again lends sweet assistance, and reason then resumes her speech. One yearns the rivers of existence, the very fonts of life to reach. Snarl not, poodle, to the sound that rises, the sacred tones that my soul embrace. This bestial noise is out of place. We are used to see that man despises what he never comprehends, and the good and the beautiful villapens, finding them often hard to measure. Will the dog, like man, snarl his displeasure? But ah, I feel, though will thereto be stronger, contentment flows from out my breast no longer. Why must the stream so soon run dry and fail us, and burning thirst again assail us? Therein I've borne so much probation, and yet this want may be supplied us, we call the supernatural to guide us. We pine and thirst for revelation, which nowhere worthier is, more nobly sent, than here, in our New Testament. I feel impelled its meaning to determine, with honest purpose once for all, the hallowed original to change to my beloved German. He opens a volume and commences. Tis written, In the beginning was the word, here I am balked. Who now can help afford? The word, impossible so high to rate it, and otherwise I must translate it. If by the spirit I am truly taught, then thus, in the beginning, was the thought. This first line let me weigh completely, lest my impatient pen proceed too fleetly. Is it the thought which works, creates indeed, in the beginning was the power I read. Yet as I write a warning is suggested, That I the sense may not have fairly tested. The spirit aids me, now I see the light. In the beginning was the act I write. If I must share my chamber with thee, poodle, Stop that howling, prithee. Cease to bark and bellow. Such a noisy, disturbing fellow I'll no longer suffer near me. One of us, dost hear me, must leave, I fear me. No longer guest right I bestow. The door is open, art free to go. But what do I see in the creature? Is that in the course of nature? Is it actual fact, or fancies, shows? How long and broad my poodle grows! He rises mightily, a canine form that cannot be. What a spectre I've harboured thus! He resembles a hippopotamus with fiery eyes, teeth terrible to see. Oh, now am I sure of thee, for all of thy half-hellish brood the key of Solomon is good. Spirits in the Corridor Someone within is caught, stay without, follow him not, like the fox in a snare, quick the old, the old hellling stare. Take heed, look about, back and forth, hover under and over, and the word works itself out. If your aid avail him, let it not fail him, for he without measure has wrought for our pleasure. First, to encounter the beast, the words of the form be addressed. Salamander, shine glorious! Wave undine as bidden, sylph be thou hidden, gnome be laborious. Who knows not their sense, these elements, their properties and power not seize, no mastery he inherits over the spirits. Vanish in flaming ether, salamander, flow foamingly together undine, 
shine in meteor sheen, sylph. Bring help to hearth and shelf. Incubus, incubus, step forward and finish thus. Of the four no feature lurks in the creature. Quiet he lies and grins disdain. Not yet, it seems, have I given him pain. Now to undisguise thee, hear me exercise thee. Art thou, my gay one, hell's fugitive stray one? The sign witness now before which they bow, the cohorts of hell. With hair all bristling it begins to swell. Base being, hearest thou? Knowest and fearest thou the one, unoriginate, named inexpressibly, through all heaven impermeate, pierced irredressibly? Behind the stove still band, see it an elephant expand. It fills the space entire, mist-like melting ever faster. Tis enough, ascend no higher. Lay thyself at the feet of the master. Thou seest not vain the threats I bring thee. With holy fire I'll scorch and sting thee. Wait not to know the threefold dazzling glow. Wait not to know the strongest art within my hands. Mephistopheles, while the vapour is dissipating, steps forth from behind the stove, in the costume of a travelling scholar. Why such a noise? What are my lord's commands? This was the poodle's real core. A travelling scholar, then. The Cossus is diverting. The learned gentleman I bow before, you have made me roundly sweat. That is certain. What is thy name? A question small, it seems, for one whose mind the world so much despises, who, scorning all external glimpses, the depths of being only prizes. With all you gentlemen, the names attest whereby the nature usually is expressed. Clearly the latter it implies in names like Beelzebub, destroyer, father of lies. Who art thou, then? Part of that power not understood, Which always wills the bad, And always walks the good. What hidden sense in this enigma lies? I am the spirit that denies, And justly so, For all things from the void called forth Deserve to be destroyed. It are better than were not created, does all which you as seen have rated destruction or to it evil plant that is my proper element thou namest thyself a part yet showest complete to me the modest truth i speak to thee if man that microcosmic fool can see himself a whole so frequently Part of the part am I once all in primal night, Part of the darkness which brought forth the light, The half delight which now disputes the space, And claims of mother night her ancient place. And yet the struggle fails, Since light, however it weaves, Still fettered unto bodies cleaves. It flows from bodies, bodies beautifies, by bodies is its course impeded, and so but little time is needed. I hope ere, as the bodies die, it dies. I see the plan thou art pursuing. Thou canst not compass general ruin, and hast on smaller scale begun. And truly it is not much when all is done. That which to not is in resistance set, the something of this clumsy world has yet, which all that I have undertaken, not been by me disturbed or shaken, from earthquake tamp based wave of volcano's brand, back into quite subtle sea and land, and the damned stuff, the bestial human brood. What use in having that to play with? How many have I made away with? and ever circulates a newer, fresher blood. It makes me furious such things beholding, from water, art, and air unfolding. A thousand germs break forth and grow, 
in dry and wet and warm and chilly and had i not the flame reserved why really there is nothing special of my own to show so to the actively eternal creative force in cold disdain you now oppose the fist infernal whose wicked clench is all in vain <laughs> some other labour seek thou rather queer son of chaos to begin well we will consider thou canst gather my views when next i venture in my tie perhaps depart at present why thou shouldst ask i don't perceive though our acquaintance is so recent for further visits thou hast leave the windows here the door is yonder a chimney also you behold i must confess that thought i may not wander my steps by one slight obstacle controlled the wizard's foot that on your threshold made is the pentagram prohibits thee why tell me now thou son of hades if that prevents how camest thou in to me could such a spirit be so cheated inspect the thing the drawing is not completed the outer angle you may see is open left the lines don't fit it well chance this time has fairly hid it and thus thou art prisoner to me it seems the business has succeeded the puddle not remarked as after thee he speeded but other respects now obtain the devil can't get out again try then the open window pane for devils and for spectres this is law where they have entered in there also they withdraw the first is free to us we are governed by the second in hell itself then laws are reckoned that's well so might a compact be made with you gentlemen and binding surely all that is promised shall delight thee purely no skinflint bargain shalt thou see but this is not of swift conclusion we will talk about the matter soon and now i do entreat this boon leave to withdraw from my intrusion one moment more i ask thee to remain some pleasant news at least to tell me release me now i soon shall come again then thou at will mayst question and compel me i have not snares around thee cast thyself hast led thyself into the meshes who traps the devil hold him fast not soon a second time he'll catch a prey so precious and to please thee also i am content to stay and serve thee in a social station but stipulating that i may with arts of mine afford thee recreation thereto i willingly agree if the diversion pleasant be my friend thou wilt win past all pretences more in this hour to soothe thy senses than in the year's monotony that which the dainty spirits sing thee the lovely pictures they shall bring thee are more than magic's empty show thy scent will be to bliss invited thy palate than with taste delighted thy nerves of touch ecstatic glow all unprepared the charm i spin we are here together so begin vanish ye darking arches above him loveliest weather born of blue ether break from the sky oh that the darking clouds had departed starlight is sparkling tranquilly hearted suns are on high heaven's own children in beauty bewildering waveringly bending pass as they hover longing unending follows them over they with their glowing garments outflowing cover in going landscape and bower where in seclusion lovers are plated lost in illusion bower on bower tendrils unblighted 
Lo, in a shower, grapes that o'er cluster gush into must, or flow into rivers that's only a flashing wine that is dashing gems as it boundeth down the high places and spreading surroundeth with crystalline spaces and happy embraces, blossoming forelands, emerald shorelands. Then and the, the winged, winged races, races drink and fly onward, fly ever sunward to the enticing islands that flatter, dipping and rising light on the water, hark the inspiring sound of their choiring, see the entrancing whirl of their dancing, all in the air are freer and fairer, some of them scaling boldly the highlands, others are sailing, circling the islands, others are flying lifeward, all hying, all for the distant star of existent rapture and love. He sleeps, and of your face, your airy number have sung him truly into slumber. For this performance I your debtor prove. Not yet art thou the man to catch the find and hold him. With fairest images of dreams enfold him, plunge him into seas of sweet untruth. Yet for the threshold's magic which controlled him, the devil needs a rat's quick tooth. I use no lengthened invocation. Here rustles one that soon will work my liberation. The lord of rats and eke of mice, Of flies and bedbugs, frogs and lice, Summons thee hither to the door sill, To know it where with just a morsel, Of oil he paints the spot for thee. There comes thou, hopping on to me, To work at once, the point which made me craven, Is forward on the ledge and graven, Another bite makes free the door. So dream thy dreams, O Faust, until we meet once more. Faust, awaking. Am I again so foully cheated? Remains there naught of lofty spirit sway, but that a dream the devil counterfeited, and that a poodle ran away? End of scene three. End of section. Scene 4 of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part 1, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Bayard Taylor. Scene 4. The Study. A knock. Come in. Again, my quiet broken. It is I. Come in. Tries must the words be spoken. Come in, then. Thus thou pleasest me. I hope we will sweet each other well. For now thy vapours to dispel. I come. A squire of high degree, in scarlet coat with golden trimming, a cloak in silken lustre swimming, a tall cock's feeder in my hat, a long sharp sword for show or quarrel, and I advise thee, brief and flat, to don the self same gay apparel, that from this den released and free, life be at last revealed to thee. This life of earth, whatever my attire, would pain me in its wonted fashion. Too old am I to play with passion, too young to be without desire. What from the world have I to gain? Thou shalt abstain, renounce, refrain, such is the everlasting song that in the ears of all men rings, that unrelieved our whole life long each hour in passing hoarsely sings. In very terror I at morn awake, Upon the verge of bitter weeping, To see the day of disappointment break, 
to no one hope of mine, not one its promise keeping, that even each joy's presentiment with willful cavil would diminish, with grinning masks of life prevent my mind its fairest work to finish. Then, too, when night descends, how anxiously upon my couch of sleep I lay me, there also comes no rest to me, but some wild dream is sent to fray me. The God that in my breast is owned can deeply stir the inner sources. The God above my powers enthroned, he cannot change external forces. So by the burden of my days oppressed, death is desired, and life a thing unblessed. And yet he is, never that, a holy welcome guest. O oh, fortunate for whom, when victory glances, The bloody laurels on the brow he bindeth, Whom after rapid, maddening dances, In clasping maiden arms he findeth, O oh, would that I before that spirit power, Ravished and rapt from life, had sunken. And yet by someone in that nightly hour, a certain liquid was not drunken. Eavesdropping, <laughs> thy pleasure seems to be. Omniscient am I not, yet much is known to me. Though some familiar tone retrieving my thoughts from torment led me on, and sweet clear echoes came deceiving a faith bequeathed from childhood's dawn, Yet now I curse whate'er entices and snares the soul with visions vain, with dazzling cheats and dear devices confines it in this cave of pain. Cursed be at once the high ambition wherewith the mind itself deludes, cursed be the glare of apparition that on the finer sense intrudes, cursed be the lying dream's impression of name and fame and laurelled brow, Cursed all that flatters as possession, as wife and child, as knave and plough. Cursed mammon be, when he with treasures to restless action spurs our fate. Cursed when, for soft, indulgent leisures, he lays for us the pillows straight. Cursed be the vine's transcendent nectar, the highest favour love lets fall. Cursed also hope, cursed faith, the spectre. And cursed be patience most of all. Whoa, whoa, thou hast, hast it destroyed, destroyed the beautiful world with powerful fist in ruin, ruin it is hurled, hurled by the blow of a demigod shattered, the scattered fragments in the void we carry, deploring the beauty perished beyond restoring. Mightier for the children of men, brightlier builded again in thine own bosom, builded anew. The new career commence with clearer sense, and the new songs of cheer be sung there too. These are the small dependents who give me attendance. Hear them to deeds and passion, counsel in shrewd old fashion. Into the world of strife, out of this lonely life, That of senses and sap has betrayed thee, They would persuade thee, This nursing of the pain forego thee, That like a vulture feeds upon thy breast. The worst society thou findst will show thee, Thou art a man among the rest. But it is not meant to trust thee Into the mob thou hatest, I am not one of the greatest, yet wilt thou to me entrust thy steps through life. I will guide thee, will willingly walk beside thee, will serve thee at once and for ever, with best endeavour. And if thou art satisfied, will a servant slave with thee abide. And what shall be my counter service, therefore? The time is long. Thou needst not now insist. No, no, the devil is an egotist, And is not apt without a why or wherefore, For God's sake others to assist. Speak thy conditions plain and clear, 
With such a servant danger comes, I fear. Here, an unwearied slave, I'll wear thy tether, And to thine every nod obedient be. When, there again we come together, Then shalt thou do the same for me. The there my scruples not increases, when thou hast dashed this world to pieces, the other then its place may fill. Here, on this earth, my pleasures have their sources. Yon sun beholds my sorrows in his courses, and when from these my life itself divorces, let happen all that can or will, I'll hear no more. Tis vain to ponder if there we cherish love or hate, Or in the spheres we dream of yonder, A high or low our souls await. In this sense even canst thou venture, Come by thyself by prompt indenture, And thou mine arts with joy shalt see, What no man ever saw I will give to thee. Canst thou, poor devil, give me whatsoever? When was a human soul in its supreme endeavour ever understood by such as thou? Yet hast thou food which never satiates now. The restless, ruddy gold hast thou that runs quicksilver-like one's fingers through, a game whose winnings no man ever knew, a maid that even from my breast beckons my neighbour with her wanton glances, and honours godlike zest the meteor that a moment dances. Show me the fruits that ere they're gathered rot, and trees that daily with new leafage clothe them. Such a demand alarms me not. Such strangers have I, and can show them. But still the time may reach us, good my friend, when peace we crave, and more luxurious diet. When on an idler's bed I stretch myself in quiet, There let at once my record end. Canst thou with lying flattery rule me, Until self-pleased myself I see? Canst thou with rich enjoyment fool me, Let that day be the last for me? The bet I offer. Done. And heartily, when thus I hail the moment flying, Ah, still delay, thou art so fair, Then bind me in thy bonds undying, My final ruin then declare, Then let the death-bell chime the token, Then art thou from thy service free, The clock may stop, the hand be broken, Then time be finished unto me. Consider well, my memory good is rated. Thou hast a perfect right thereto. My powers I have not rashly estimated. A slave am I, whate'er I do. If thine or whose, tis needless to debate it. Then at the doctor's banquet, I to-day will as a servant wait behind thee. But one thing more, beyond all risk to bind thee, Give me a line or two, I pray. Demand'st thou, pedant, too, a document? Hast never known a man, nor proved his words intent? Is it not enough that what I speak to-day Shall stand with all my future days agreeing? In all its tides sweeps not the world away, And shall a promise bind my being? Yet this delusion in our hearts we bear, Who would himself therefrom deliver? Blessed he whose bosom truth makes pure and fair, No sacrifice shall he repent of ever. Nathless a parchment, writ and stamped with care, A spectre is, which all to shun endeavour. The world, alas, dies even in the pen, And wax and leather keep the lordship then. What wilt from me, base spirit, say? Brass, marble, parchment, paper, clay, the terms with graver, quill, or chisel stated, I freely leave the choice to thee. Why he thyself does instantly, with eloquence exaggerated. Each leave for such a pact is good, and to subscribe thy name thou wilt take a drop of blood. 
If thou therewith art fully satisfied, so let us by the farce abide. Blood is a juice of rarest quality. Fear not that I this pact shall seek to sever. The promise that I make to thee is just the sum of my endeavour. I have myself inflated all too high. My proper place is thy estate. The mighty spirit deigns me no reply, and nature shuts on me her gate. The thread of thought at last is broken, and knowledge brings disgust unspoken. Let us the sensual depths explore, to quench the fervours of glowing passion. Let every marvel take form and fashion, through the impervious veil at war. Plunge we in time's tumultuous dance, in the rush and roll of circumstance. Then may delight and distress, and worry and success alternately follow as best they can. Restless activity proves the man. For you no bound no time is set, whether you everywhere be trying, or snatch a rapid bliss in flying. May it agree with you what you get, only fall to, and show no timid balking. But thou hast heard, tis not of joy we're talking. I take the wildering whirl, enjoyment's keenest pain, enamoured hate, exhilarant disdain. My bosom of its thirst for knowledge sated shall not henceforth from any pang be rested, and all of life for all mankind created shall be within mine inmost being tested. The highest, lowest forms my soul shall borrow, shall heap upon itself their bliss and sorrow, and thus my own soul's self to all their selves expanded, I too at last shall with them all be stranded. Believe me, who for many a thousand year the same tough meat have chewed and tested, that from the cradle to the beer no man the ancient leaven has digested. Trust one of us, this whole supernal is made but for a god's delight. He dwells in splendor single and eternal, but us he trusts in darkness out of sight. And ill he dowers with day and night. Nay, but I will. A good reply. One only fear still needs repeating. The art is long, the time is fleeting. Then let thyself be taught, say I. Go lick thyself with a poet. Give the rein to his imagination. Then wear the crown and show it of the qualities of his creation. The courage of a lion's breed, the wild stag's speed, the Italian's fiery blood, the nod's farm fortitude. Let him find for thee the secret teeter that binds the noble and mean together, and teach thy pulses of youth and pleasure to love by rule and hate by miser. I'd like myself such a one to see, some microcosm his name should be. What am I, then, if tis denied my part, the crown of all humanity to win me, whereto yearns every sense within me? Why, on the whole, thou art what thou art. Set weeks of million curls upon thy head to raise thee, where sues and ill in height the truth betrays thee. And thou remainst what thou art. I feel indeed that I have made the treasure of human thought and knowledge mine in vain. And if I now sit down in restful leisure, no fount of newer strength is in my brain. I am no hair's breadth more in height nor nearer to the infinite. Good sir, you see the facts precisely as they are seen by each and all. We must arrange them now more wisely, before the joys of life shall pale. Why chance, both hands and feet are truly, and head and viral forces dine, yet all that I indulge in nearly, is a tense less holy mine. If I have six stallions in my stall, are not their forces also lent me? I speed along, completest man of all. 
as though my legs were four and twenty. Take hold and let reflection rest, and plunge into the world with chest. I say to thee, a speculative wire is like a beast on a moorland sleep, that round and round some find misleads to evil plight, while all about lie pastures fresh and green. Then how shall we begin? We will try a wider sphere. What place of martyrdom is here? Is it life, I ask, is it even prudence, To bore thyself and bore the students? Let neighbor punch to that attend. Why plague thyself with trashing straw forever? The best thou learnest in the end. Thou darest not tell the youngsters never. I hear one's footsteps, he does cheering. To see him now I have no heart. So long the poor boy waits a hearing. He must not unconsult the path. Thy cap and mantle straight will end me. I'll play the comedy with art. He disguises himself. My wits be certain will befriend me. But fifteen minutes' time is all I need. For our fine trip, meanwhile, prepare thyself with speed. Exit Faust. Mephistopheles in Faust's long mantle. Reason and knowledge only thou despise, the highest strength in man that lies. Let but the lying spirit bind thee, with magic walks and shows that blind thee, and I shall have thee fast and sure. Fate such a bold untrammelled spirit gave him, as forwards onwards ever must endure, whose overhast impulse drave him past oddly joys he might secure. Dragged through the wildest life, will I enslave him, through flat and stale indifference, with struggling, chilling, checking, so deprave him that to his heart in such sense. The dream of drink shall mark, but never leave him. Refreshment shall his lips in vain implore, had he not made himself the devils, not could save him. Still were he lost for evermore. A student enters. A short time only am I here, and come devoted and sincere. To greet and know the man of fame, who men to me with reverence name. Your courtesy doth flatter me. You see a man as others be. Have you, perchance, elsewhere began? Receive me now, I pray, as one who comes to you with courage good, somewhat of cash, and healthy blood, my mother was hardly willing to let me. But knowledge worth having I fain would get me. Then you have reached the right place now. I'd like to leave it, I must avow. I find these walls, these vaulted spaces, are anything but pleasant places. Tis all so cramped and close and mean. One sees no tree, no glimpse of green. And when the lecture halls receive me, seeing, hearing, and thinking leave me. All that depends on habitude. So from its mother's breasts a child, at first reluctant, takes its food. But soon to see them is beguiled. Thus, at the breasts of wisdom clinging, Thou wilt find each day a greater rapture bringing. I'll hang thereon with joy and freely drain them, But tell me, pray, the proper means to gain them. Explain before you father speak, The special faculty you seek. I crave the highest erudition, And fain would make my acquisition All that there is in earth and heaven, In nature and science too. Here is the genuine path for you, yet strict attention must be given. Body and soul thereon I'll reek, yet truly I've some inclination on summer holidays to seek a little freedom and recreation. Use well your time. It flies so swiftly from us. But time, true order, may be one, I promise. So, friend, my views to briefly sum. First, the Coliseum Logicum. There will your mind be drilled and braced, as if in Spanish boots it were laced, and thus to graver paces brought, 
It will plod along the path of thought, instead of shooting here and there, a willow that wisp in murky air. Days will be spent to bid you know what once you did at a single blow, like eating and drinking, free and strong, that one to three dare to belong. Truly the fabric of mental fleece resembles a weaver's masterpiece, where a thousand threads one treadle throws, where fly the shuttles hither and thither, unseen the threads are knit together, and an infinite combination grows. Then the philosopher steps in, and shows no otherwise it could have been. The first was so, the second so, therefore the third and fourth are so. Were not the first and second, then the third and fourth had never been. The scholars are everywhere believers, but never succeed in being weavers. He who would study organic existence first drives out the soul with rigid persistence. Then the parts in his hand he may hold and clasp, but the spiritual link is lost, alas, and carries in nature's this chemistry names, nor knows how herself she banters and blames. I cannot understand you quite. Your mind will shortly be set aright when you have learned all things reducing to classify them for your using. I feel as stupid from all you've said as if a meal will whirled in my head. And after first and foremost duty of metaphysics learn the ills and beauty, see that you most profoundly gain what does not sweet the human brain. A splendid word to serve you will find, for what goes in or won't go in your mind. But first at least this half a year to order rigidly adhere, five hours a day you understand, and when the clock strikes, be on hand. Prepare beforehand for your part, with paragraphs all got by heart, so you can better watch and look, that not is said but what is in the book, yet in thy writing as unwearied be, as did the Holy Ghost dictate to thee. No need to tell me twice to do it, I think how useful tis to write, for what one has in black and white, one carries home and then goes through it. Yet choose thyself a faculty. I cannot reconcile myself to jurisprudence. Nor can I therefore greatly blame you, students. I know what science this has come to be. All rights and laws are still transmitted like an eternal sickness of the race. From generation unto generation fitted and sifted round from place to place. Reason becomes a sham, beneficence a worry. Thou art a grandchild, therefore woe to thee, the right born with us, ours in verity. This to consider, there is, alas, no hurry. My own disgust is strengthened by your speech. O lucky ye whom you shall teach, I've almost for theology decided. I should not wish to see you here misguided, for as regards this science, let me hint. It is very hard to shun the false direction. There is so much secret poison lurking in it, so, like the medicine, it baffles your detection. Here, therefore, one alone, for that is best, in sooth, and simply take your master's words for truth. On words, let your attention center, then through the safest gate you will enter, the temple halls of certainty. Yet in the word must some idea be. Of course. But only shun to overshop a tension, for just where fails the comprehension, a word steps promptly in as deputy. With words, it is excellent disputing, systems to words, it is easy sweeting. On words, it is excellent believing, no word can ever lose a jot from thieving. Pardon, with many questions I detain you, yet must I trouble you again. Of medicine I still would fain. Hear one strong word that might explain you. Three years is but a little space, and God, who can the feel embrace? If one some index could be shown, twere easier groping forward, truly. Aside. I am tired of this dry tone. Must play the devil again, and fully. Aloud. To grasp the spirit of medicine is easy. Learn of the great and little world your feel. 
to let it go at last, so please ye, yeah, just as God will. In vain that through the reams of science you may drift, each one learns only just what learn he can. Yet he who grasps the moment's gift, he is the proper man. Well made you are, it is not to be denied, the rest a bold address will win you. If you but in yourself confide, at once confide all others in you. To lead the women, learn the special feeling. Their everlasting aches and groans, in thousand tones, have all one source, one mode of healing. And if your acts are half discreet, you will always have them at your feet. A title first must draw and interest them, and show that yours all other arts exceeds. Then as a greeting you are free to touch and test them, while thus to do for years another please. You press and count the pulse's dances, and then with burning sidelong glances, you clasp the swelling hips to see if tightly laced her corsets be. That's better now. The how and where one sees. My worthy friend, grey are all theories, and green alone life's golden tree. I swear to you, tis like a dream to me. Might I again presume, with trust unbounded, to hear your wisdom thoroughly expounded? Most willingly, to what extent I may. I cannot really go away. Allow me that my album must first reach you. Grant me this favor, I beseech you. Assuredly. He writes and returns the book. Reads. Editus Secret Deus, Saintus Bonum et Malum. Closes the book with reverence and withdraws. Followed ancient text, and the snake thou wast ordered to trample. With all the likeness to God, thou wilt yet be a sorry example. Faust enters. Now, whither shall we go? As best it pleases thee, the little world, and then the great we will see. With what delight, what profit winning. Shalt thou sponge to the town beginning? Yet with the flowing beard I wear, Both ease and grace will fail me there. The attempt indeed were a futile strife. I never could learn the ways of life. I feel so small before others, And thence should always find embarrassments. My friend, thou soon shalt lose all such misgiving. Be thou but supposest, thou hast the art of leaving. How shall we leave the house and start? Where hast thou servant, coach, and horses? We will spread this cloak with proper art, Then through the air direct our courses. But only on so bold a flight, Be sure to have thy luggage light. A little burning air, which I shall soon prepare us, Above the art will nimbly bear us. And if we are light, we will travel swift and clear. I gratulate thee, on thy new career. End of scene four. End of section. Scenes five and six of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part One, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Bayard Taylor. Scene Five, Auerbach Cellar in Leipzig. Carousal of jolly companions. Is no one laughing? No one drinking? I'll teach you how to grin. I'm thinking. Today you're like wet straw, so tame, and usually you're all aflame. Now that's your fault. From you we nothing see, no beastliness and no stupidity. Pours a glass of wine over Brander's head. Here's both together. Twice a swine. You wanted them. I've given you mine. Turn out who quarrels, out the door. With open throat sing chorus, drink and roar. Up, holla, ho! Woe's me, the fearful bellow! Bring cotton quick, he split my ears, that fellow! When the vault echoes to the song, One first perceives the bass is deep and strong. Well said, and out with him that takes the least offence! 
Atalarada. Atzaralarad. The throats are tuned. Commence. The dear old holy Roman realm, how does it hold together? A nasty song. Fie, a political song. A most offensive song. Thank God, each morning, therefore, that you have not the Roman realm to care for. At least I hold it so much gained for me that I nor Chancellor nor Kaiser be. Yet also we must have a ruling head, I hope, and so we'll choose ourselves a Pope. You know the quality that can decide the choice and elevate the man. Soar up, soar up, Dame Nightingale, ten thousand times my sweetheart hail. No, greet my sweetheart not. I'll tell you, I'll resent it. My sweetheart, greet and kiss. I dare you to prevent it. Draw the latch the darkness makes. Draw the latch the lover awakes. Shut the latch the morning breaks. Yes, sing away, sing on and praise and brag of her. I'll wait my proper time for laughter. Me by the nose she led, and now she'll lead you after. Her paramour should be an ugly gnome where four roads cross in wanton play to meet her. An old he-goat from Bloxburg coming home should his good night in lustful gallop lead her. A fellow made of genuine flesh and blood is for the wench a deal too good. Greet her? Not I, unless when meeting to smash her windows be a greeting. Pounding on the table. Attention, hearken now to me. Confess, sirs, I know how to live, and amid persons here have we, and I, as suits their quality, must something fresh for their advantage give. Take heed, tis of the latest cut my strain, and all strike in at each refrain. There was a rat in the cellar, nest too fat, and butter made smoother. He had a paunch beneath his vest, like that of Dr. Luther. The cook laid poison cunningly, and then a sort of pressed was he, as if he had love in his bosom. Shouting. As, as if he had love in his, his bosom. bosom. He ran around, he ran about, his thirst in puddles laving. He gnawed and scratched the house throughout, but nothing cured his raving. He whirled and jumped with torment mad, and soon enough the poor beast had, as if he had love in his bosom. As, as if he had love in his, his bosom. And driven at last in open day, he ran into the kitchen, fell on the hearth and squirming lay in the last convulsion twitching. Then laughed the murderess in her glee, ha ha, he's at his last gasp, said she. As if he had love in his bosom. As, as if he had love in his bosom. How the dull fools enjoy the matter. To me it is a proper art. Poison for such poor rats to scatter. Perhaps you warmly take their part. The bald pate pot belly I have noted. Misfortune tames him by degrees, for in the rat by poison bloated his own most natural form he sees. Before all else I bring thee hither, where boon companions meet together, to let thee see how smooth life runs away. Here for the folk its day is a holiday, with little wheat and ease to sweet them, they whirl in narrow circling trails, like kittens playing with their tails. And if no headache persecute them, so long the host may credit give, they merrily and careless leave. The fact is easy to unravel, their air so odd, they've just returned from travel, a single hour they've not been here. You verily hit the truth, Leipzig to me is dear, Paris in miniature, how it refines its people. Who are the strangers, should you guess? Let me alone. I'll set them first to drinking, and then 
as one a child's tooth draws with cleverness. I'll worm their secret out, I'm thinking. They're of a noble house, that's very clear. Haughty and discontented they appear. They're mountebanks upon a revel. Perhaps. Look out, I'll smoke them now. Not if he had them by the neck, I vow. Would ever these people sent the devil. Fair greeting, gentlemen. Our thanks, we give the same. Murmurs, inspecting Mephistopheles from the side. In one foot is the fellow lame? Is it permitted that we share your laser? In place of cheering drink which one seeks vainly here, your company shall give us pleasure. A most fastidious person you appear. No doubt twas late when you from Ripex started, and supping there with Hans occasioned your delay. We passed without a call to-day. At our last interview, before we parted, much of his cousins did his pick and treating that we should give to each his kindly greeting. He bows to Frosh. Aside. You have it now, he understands. A knave sharp set. Just wait a while, I'll have him yet. If I am right, we heard the sound of well-trained voices singing chorus. And truly, song must here rebound superbly from the arches over us. Are you perhaps a virtuoso? Oh no, my wish is great. My power is only so-so. Give us a song. If you desire. A number. So that it be a brand new strain. We have just retraced our way from Spain, the lovely land of wine and song and slumber. There was a king once reigning, who had a big black flea. Hear, hear, a flea! Do you rightly take the jest? I call a flea a tidy guest. There was a king once reigning, who had a big black flea, and loved him past explaining. As his own son were he. He calls his man of stitches, The tailor comes straight away. Here measure the lap for breeches, And measure his coat, I say. But mind, allow the tailor no caprices, Enjoin upon him, as his head is dear, To most exactly measure, so and sheer, So that the breeches have no creases. In silk and velvet gleaming, he now was wholly dressed, had a coat with ribbons streaming, a cross upon his breast. He had the first of stations, the minister star and name, and also all his relations, great lords at court became. And the lords and ladies of honour were plagued awake and in bed, the queen she got them up on her, the maids were bitten and bred, and they did not dare to brush them. Or scratch them day or night. We crack them and we crush them at once whenever they buy. Shouting. We, we crack, crack them, them and we crush them at once whenever, whenever they, they bite. bite. Bravo, bravo, that was fine. Every flea may it so befall. Point your fingers and nip them all. Hurrah for freedom, hurrah for wine. I fain would drink with you, my glass to freedom clinking. If it were a better wine that here I see you drinking. Don't let us hear that speech again. Did I not fear the landlord might complain? I treat these worthy guests with pleasure, To sum from out our sailor's treasure. Just treat, and let the landlord me arraign. And if the wine be good, our praises shall be ample, But do not give too very small a sample. For if it's quality I decide, with a goodly mouthful, I must be supplied. Aside. They're from the Rhine. I guessed as much before. Bring me a gimlet here. What shall therewith be done? You've not the casks already at the door. Yonder, within the landlord's box of tools, there's one. Takes the gimlet. To Frosh. Now, give me of your taste some intimation. How do you mean? Have you so many kinds? The choice is free. Make up your minds. To Frosh. Aha! Uh -huh. You lick your chops from sheer anticipation. Good! If I have the choice, so let the wine be Rhinish. 
our fatherland can best the sparkling cup replenish. Boring a hole in the edge of the table at the place where Frosh sits. Give me a little wax to make the stopper squeak. Ah, uh, I perceive a juggler's trick. To Brander. And you? Champagne shall be my wine, and let it sparkle fresh and fine. Bores. In the meantime, one has made the wax stoppers and plugged the holes with them. What's foreign, one can't always keep quite clear of, for good things oft are not so near. A German can't endure the French to see or hear of, yet drinks their wines with hearty cheer. As Mephistopheles approaches his seat. For me, I grant, sour wine is out of place. Fill up my glass with sweetest, will you? Boring. To case I'll flow at once to feel you. No, look me, sir, straight in the face. I see you have your fun at our expense. Oh, no, with gentlemen of such pretense, that were to venture far indeed. Speak out and make your choice with speed. With what a vintage can I serve you? With any, only satisfy our need. After the holes have been bored and plugged, with singular gestures. Grapes the wine stem bears, horns the he good wears. The grapes are juicy, the wines are good. The wooden table gives wine as good. Into the depths of nature appear, only believe there's a miracle here. Now draw the stoppers and drink your feel. As they draw out the stoppers and the wine which has been desired flows into the glass of each. O oh, beautiful fountain that flows at will. will! But have a care that you nothing spill. They drink repeatedly. Sing. As to five hundred hogs we feel so canonic joy. joy. See, now the race is happy. It is free. To leave them is my inclination. Take notice first. Their bestiality will make a brilliant demonstration. Drinks carelessly, the wine spills upon the earth and turns to flame. Help! Fire! Help! Hellfire is sent! Charming away the flame. Be quiet, friendly element. To the revellers. A bit of purgatory it was for this time, merely. What mean you? Wait! You'll pay for it dearly. You'll know us to your detriment. Don't try that game a second time upon us. I think we'd better send him packing quietly. What, sir? You dare to make so free and play your hocus-pocus on us? Be still, old wine tub. Broomstick, you. You face it out impertinent and heady. Just wait. A shower of blows is ready. Draws a stopper out of the table. Fire flies in his face. I burn! I burn! Tis magic! Strike! The knave is outlawed. Cut him as you like. They draw their knives and rush upon Mephistopheles. With solemn gestures. False word and a form of air. Chains, place and sense and snare. Be here and there. They stand amazed and look at each other. Where am I? What a lovely land. Vines, can I trust my eyes? And purple grapes at hand. Here, over this green arbor bending, see what a vine, what grapes depending. He takes Siebel by the nose, the others do the same reciprocally, and raise their knives. As above. Lose error from their eyes the band, and how the devil jests be now enlightened. He disappears with Faust, the revelers start and separate. What happened? How? Was that your nose I tightened? To Siebel. And yours still I have in hand? It was a blow that went through every limb. Give me a chair. I sink. My senses swim. But what has happened? Tell me now. Where is he? If I catch the scoundrel hiding, he shall not leave alive, I vow. I saw him with these eyes upon a wine cask riding out of the cellar door just now. Still in my feet the fright like lead is weighing. He turns towards the table. Why, if the fount of wine should still be playing? T'was all deceit and lying, false design. And yet it seemed as I were drinking wine. But with the grapes, how was it, pray? Shall one believe no miracles, just say? Scene 6 
Witch's Kitchen. Upon a low hearth stands a great cauldron, under which a fire is burning. Various figures appear in the vapours which rise from the cauldron. An ape sits beside it, skims it, and watches lest it boil over. The he-ape, with the young one, sits near and warms himself. Ceiling and walls are covered with the most fantastic witch implements. These crazy signs of witches' craft repel me. I shall recover, dost thou tell me, through this insane chaotic play? From an old hag shall I demand assistance? And will her foul mess take away full thirty years from my existence? Woe's me! Canst thou not better find? Another baffled hope must be lamented. Has nature, then, and has a noble mind, not any potent balsam yet invented? Once more, my friend, thou talkest sensibly. There is to make the young a simpler mode and apter. But in another book it is read for thee, and is a most eccentric chapter. Yet will I know it. Good. The method is revealed without our gold or magic or physician. Betake thyself to yonder field. Dear hoe and dig as thy condition. Restrain thyself, thy sense and will, within the narrow sphere to flourish. With unmixed food thy body nourish. Live with the ox as ox, and think it not a theft, that thou manurest the acre which thou reapest. That, trust to me, is the best mode left, whereby for eighty years thy youth thou keepest. I am not used to that. I cannot stoop to try it. To take the spade in hand and ply it, the narrow being suits me not at all. Then to thine aid the witch must call. Wherefore the hag and her alone? Canst thou thyself not brew the potion? That were a charming sport, I own. I would build a thousand bridges, meanwhile, I have a notion. Not art and science serve alone. Patience must in the walk be shown. Long is the calm brain active in creation. Time only strengthens the fine fermentation. And all belonging thereunto is rare and strange, however you take it. The devil taught the thing, it is true. And yet, the devil cannot make it. Perceiving the animals. See what a delicate race they be. That is the maid, the man is he. To the animals. It seems the mistress has gone away. Carousing today, today. Off and, and about, about by, by the, the chimney, chimney out. out. What time takes she for dissipating? While, While we, we to warm, warm our paws, paws are, are waiting. waiting. To Faust. How findest thou the tender creatures? Absurder than I ever yet did see. Why just such talk as this for me? Is that which the most attractive features? To the animals. But tell me now, ye cast puppets, why do ye tea the poor is so? We are cooking watery soup, soup for beggars. beggars. Then a great public you can show. Comes up and fawns on Mephistopheles. Oh, cast thou the dice, make me rich in a trice, let me win in good season, things are badly controlled, and had I but gold, so had I my reason. How the ape be sure his luck enhances, could he but try the lottery's chances? In the meantime the young apes have been playing with a large ball which they now roll forward. Hmm. The world's the ball, doth rise and fall, and roll incessant like glass doth ring, a hollow thing. How soon will spring and drop quiescent, here bright it gleams, here brighter seems, I live at present, dear son, I say, keep thou away, thy doom is spoken, tis made of clay, and will be broken. What means the sieve? Taking it down. Wert thou the thief, I'd know him and shame him. He runs to the she-ape, and lets her look through it. Look through the sieve. Know'st thou the thief, and darest not name him? 
approaching the fire. And what is this pot? The, the fool knows, knows it not. not. He, he knows, knows not the pot. pot. He, he knows, knows not the kettle. kettle. Impertinent beast. Take the brush here, at least, and sit down on the settle. He invites Mephistopheles to sit down. Faust, who during all this time has been standing before a mirror, now approaching and now retreating from it. What do I see? What heavenly form revealed shows through the glass from magic's fair dominions? Oh, lend me, love, the swiftest of thy pinions, and bear me to her beauteous field. Ah, if I leave this spot with fond designing, if I attempt to venture near, dim as through gathering mist her charms appear, a woman's form in beauty shining, can woman then so lovely be? And must I find her body there reclining, of all the heavens the bright epitome? Can earth with such a thing be mated? Why, surely, if a god first plagues himself six days, then self-contented, bravo says, must something clever be created. This time thine eyes be satiate, I'll yet detect thy sweetheart and ensnare her, and blessed is he who has the lucky fate, some day as bridegroom home to bear her. Faust gazes continually in the mirror. Mephistopheles, stretching himself out on the settle, and playing with the brush, continues to speak. So sit I, like the king upon his throne. I hold the sceptre here, and like the crown alone. The animals, who up to this time have been making all kinds of fantastic movements, together bring a crown to Mephistopheles with great noise. Oh, be thou so good, with sweat and with blood! The to crown to be lame. They handle the crown awkwardly and break it into two pieces with which they spring around. Tis done, done, let it be. be. We, we speak, speak and we see. We hear and, and we rhyme. rhyme. Before the mirror. Woe's me. I fear to lose my wits. Pointing to the animals. My own head now is really nigh to sinking. If, if lucky are hits, hits and, and everything, everything fits, fits Tis thought, and we're, and we're thinking. thinking. As above. My bosom burns with that sweet vision. Let us with speed away from here. In the same attitude. One must at least make this admission. They are poets, genuine and sincere. The cauldron, which the she-ape has up to this time neglected to watch, begins to boil over. There ensues a great flame which blazes out the chimney. The witch comes careering down through the flame with terrible cries. Ow! 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 The damned beast! The cursed sow! To leave the kettle and singe the frow! A cursed fear! Perceiving Faust and Mephistopheles. What is that here? Who are you here? What wants you thus? Who sneaks to us? The fire pain, burn bone and brain. She plunges the skimming ladle into the cauldron and scatters flames towards Faust, Mephistopheles and the animals. The animals whimper. Mephistopheles, reversing the brush, which he has been holding in his hand and striding among the jars and glasses. In two, in two, there lies the brew, there lies the glass, the joke will pass. As time foul as to the singing of thy crew. As the witch starts back, full of wrath and horror. Ha, knowest thou me? Abomination thou. Knowest thou at last thy lord and master? What hinders me from smitting now thee and thy monkey sprites with fell disaster? Hast for the scarlet coat no reverence? Dost recognize no more the tall cock's feeder? Have I counseled discountenance? Must tell my name, old face of ladder. O oh, pardon, sir, the rough salute. Yet I perceive no cloven foot. And both your ravens, where are they now? This time I laid the escape the debt. For since we two together met, it is verily full many a day now. 
culture would smooth the whole world licks, also unto the devil's sticks. The days of the old northern phantom now are over, where canst thou horns and tail and claws discover? And as regards the foot, which I cannot spare in truth, it did only make the people shun me. Therefore I have worn, like many a spindly youth, false carbs these many years upon me. Dancing. Reason and sense forsake my brain, since I behold Squire Satan here again. Woman, from such a name refrain. Why so? What has it done to thee? It has long been written in the book of fable, yet therefore no whit better man we see. The evil one has left, the evil ones are stable. Sir Baron, call me thou, then is the matter good. A cavalier am I, like others in my bearing. Thou hast no doubt about my noble blood. See, here is the coat of arms that I am wearing. He makes an indecent gesture, laughs immoderately. Ha, ha, ha! That's just your way, I know. A rogue you are, and you were always so. To Faust. My friend, take proper heed, I pray, to manage witches. This is just a way. Wherein, sirs, can I be of use? Give us a goblet of the well-known juice, but I must beg you of the oldest brewage, the years the double strength produce. With all my heart. Now, here's a bottle wherefrom sometimes I wet my throttle, which also not the slightest stinks. And willingly a glass I'll fill him. Whispering. Yet if this man without due preparation drinks, as well thou know'st, within an hour twill kill him. He is a friend of mine, with whom it will agree, and he deserves thy kitchen's best potation. Come, draw thy circle, speak thine adjuration, and feel thy goblet full and free. The witch, with fantastic gestures, draws a circle, and places mysterious articles therein. Meanwhile the glasses begin to ring, the cauldron to sound, and make a musical accompaniment. Finally she brings a great book, and stations in the circle the apes, who are obliged to serve as reading desk, and to hold the torches. She then beckons Faust to approach. To Mephistopheles. Now what shall come of this? The creature's antic, the crazy stuff, the gestures frantic, all the repulsive cheats I view are known to me and hated too. Oh, nonsense, that is a thing for laughter. Don't be so terribly severe. She juggles you as docked now, that after the beverage may walk the proper cheer. The witch begins to declaim with much emphasis from the book. See, thus it's done. Make ten of one, and two let be, make even three. And rich thou it be, cast o'er the four. From five and six, the witch's tricks, make seven and eight, tis finished straight. And nine is one, and ten is none. This is the witch's. Once one's one. She talks like one who raves in fever. Thou wilt hear much more before we leave her. It is all the same, the book I can repeat. Such time I have squandered over the history. A contradiction does complete. Is always for the wise, no less than fools, a mystery. The art is old and new, for verily all ages have been taught the matter by three and one, and one and three, error instead of truth to scatter. They pray it and teach, and no one interferes. All from the fellowship of fools are shrinking. Man usually believes, if only words he hears, that also it then goes material for thinking. The witch continues. The lofty skill of science still from all men deeply hidden, who takes no thought, to him tis brought, tis given, unsought, unbidden. What nonsense she declaims before us! 
My head is nigh to split, I fear. It seems to me as if I hear a hundred thousand fools in chorus. Oh, Cyril, excellent, enough of adjuration. But heeder, bring us thy potation, and quickly fill the beaker to the brim. This drink will bring my friend no injuries. He is a man of manifold degrees, and many draughts are known to him. The witch, with many ceremonies, pours the drink into a cup. As Faust sets it to his lips, a light flame arises. Down with it quickly. Drain it off. It will warm thy heart with new desire. Art with the devil hand and glove, and wilt thou be afraid of fire? The witch breaks the circle. Faust steps forth. And now away. Thou darest not rest. And much good may the liquor do thee. To the witch. Thy wish on Walpurgis night expressed, What boon I have shall then be given unto thee. Here is a song which if you sometimes sing, You'll find it a peculiar operation. To Faust. Come, walk at once. A rapid occupation must start the needful perspiration, And through thy frame the liker spot and sling. The noble indolence I'll teach thee then to treasure, And soon thou wilt be aware, with keenest thrills of pleasure, How keep its tears and lips on light and restless wing. One rapid glance within the mirror give me, How beautiful that woman form! No, no, the paragon of all, believe me, Thou soon shalt see, alive and whole. Aside. Thou wilt find this drink thy blood compelling, Each woman beautiful as Helen. End of scene six. End of section. Scene seven to twelve of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part One, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Bayard Taylor. Scene seven. Street. Faust, Margaret passing by. Fair lady. Let it not offend you that arm and escort I would lend you. I'm neither lady, neither fair, and home I can go without your care. She releases herself and exit. By heaven, the girl is wondrous fair, of all I've seen beyond compare, so sweetly virtuous and pure, and yet a little pert, be sure, the lips so red the cheeks clear dawn i'll not forget while the world rolls on how she cast down her timid eyes deep in my heart imprinted lies how short and sharp of speech was she why twas a real ecstasy mephistopheles enters here of that girl i'd have possession which then the one who just went by she did she is coming from confession of every scene absolved, For I, behind her chair, was listening nigh. So innocent is she indeed, That to confess she had no need. I have no power over souls so green. And yet she is older than fourteen. How now? You are talking like Jack Rake, Who for every flower for himself would take and fancies there are no favours more, nor honours save for him in store. Yet always doesn't the thing succeed. Most worthy pedagogue, take heed. Let not a word of moral law be spoken. I claim, I tell thee, all my right, and if that image of delight rest not within mine arms to-night, at midnight our compact is broken. But think the chances of the case. I need at least a fortnight's space to find an opportune occasion. Had I but seven hours for all, I should not on the devil call, but win her by my own possession. You almost like a Frenchman, Pret. Yet pray, don't take it as annoyance. Why all at once exhaust the joyance? 
your bliss is by no means so great as if you'd use to get control all sorts of tender rigmarole and knead and shape hard to your thought as in italian tales it is taught without that i have appetite but now leave jesting out of sight i tell you once for all that speed with this fair girl will not succeed by storms he cannot captured be we must make use of strategy get me something the angel keeps lead me thither where she sleeps get me a kerchief from her breast a garter that her knee has pressed that you may see how much i would fain father and satisfy your pain we will no longer lose a minute i'll find her room to-day and take you in it and shall i see possess her no unto a neighbour she must go and meanwhile thou alone mayst glow with every hope of future pleasure breeding her atmosphere in fullest misery. can we go thither it is too early yet a gift for her i bid thee get exit presence at once that's good he is certain to get at her full many a pleasant place i know and treasures buried long ago i must perforce look up the matter exit scene eight evening a small neatly kept chamber margaret plaiting and binding up the braids of her hair i'd give something could i but say who was that gentleman to-day surely a gallant man was he and of a noble family and much could i in his face behold and he wouldn't else have been so bold exit come in but gently follow me leave me alone i beg of thee prying about not every girl gives things so neat looking around oh welcome twilight soft and sweet that breathes throughout this hallowed shrine sweet pain of love bind thou with fetters fleet the heart that on the dew of hope must pine how all around a sense impresses of quiet order and content this poverty what bounty blesses what bliss within this narrow den is pent he throws himself into a leathern armchair near the bed receive me thou that in thine open arms departed joy and pain wert wont to gather how oft the children with their ruddy charms hung here around this throne where sat the father perchance my love amid the childish band grateful for gifts the holy christmas gave her here meekly kissed the grandsire's withered hand i feel o oh maid thy very soul of order and content around me whisper which leads thee with its motherly control the cloth upon thy board bids smoothly thee unroll the sand beneath thy feet makes whiter crisper o oh, dearest hand to thee tis given to change this hut into a lower heaven and here he lifts one of the bed curtains what sweetest thrill is in my blood here could i spend whole hours delaying here nature shaped as if in sportive playing the angel blossom from the bud here lay the child with life's warm essence the tender bosom filled and fair and here was wrought through holier purer presence the form diviner beings wear and i what drew me here with power how deeply am i moved this hour what seek i why so full my heart and sore miserable faust i know thee now no more is there a magic vapour here i came with lust of instant pleasure and lie dissolved in dreams of love's sweet leisure are we the sport of every changeful atmosphere and if this moment came she in to me how would i for the fault atonement render how small the giant lout would be prone at her feet relaxed and tender 
Be quick. I see her there returning. Go, go. I never will retreat. Here is a cascade not unmeet, which elsewhere I have just been awning. Here, set it in the press with haste. I swear it will turn her head to spy it. Some bubbles I therein had placed, that you might win another by it. True, child is child, and play is play. I know not. Should I do it? Ask you, pray. Yourself perhaps would keep the bubble. Then I suggest it were fair and just to spare the lovely day your last, and spare to me the further trouble. You are not miserly, I trust. I rub my hands with expectation tender. He places the casket in the press and locks it again. Now quick away. The sweet young maiden to betray, so that by wish and will you bend her. And you look as though to the lecture hall you were forced to go, as if stood before you grey and load, physics and metaphysics both. But away. Exeunt. Margaret with a lamp. It is so close, so sultry here. She opens the window. And yet tis not so warm outside. I feel, I know not why, such fear. Would mother came. Where can she bide? My body's chill and shuddering. I'm but a silly, fearsome thing. She begins to sing while undressing. There was a king in Thule, Was faithful till the grave, To whom his mistress dying, A golden goblet gave. Nought was to him more precious, he drained it at every bout. His eyes with tears ran over, as oft as he drank thereout. When came his time of dying, the towns in his land he told, nought else to his heir denying, except the goblet of gold. He sat at the royal banquet With his knights of high degree In the lofty hall of his fathers In the castle by the sea There stood the old carouser And drank the last life glow And hurled the hallowed goblet into the tide below he saw it plunging and filling and sinking deep in the sea then fell his eyelids forever and never more drank he she opens the press in order to arrange her clothes and perceives the casket of jewels how comes that lovely casket here to me i locked the press most certainly "'Tis truly wonderful. What can within it be? Perhaps t'was bought by some one as a pawn, and mother gave a loan thereon. And here there hangs a key to fit. I have a mind to open it. What is that? God in heaven! Whence came such things? Never beheld I aught so fair. Rich ornaments, such as a noble dame on highest holidays might wear. How would the pearl chain suit my hair? Ah, who may all this splendour own? She adorns herself with the jewellery and steps before the mirror. Were but the earrings mine, alone. One has at once another air. What helps one's beauty? Youthful blood. One may possess them, well and good, but none the more do others care. They praise us half in pity, sure. To gold still tends. On gold depends all. All. Alas, we poor. Scene 9. Promenade. Faust, walking thoughtfully up and down. To him, Mephistopheles. By our love ever rejected, By hellfire hot and unsparing, I wish I knew something worse That I might use it for swearing. What ails thee? What is it grips thee, elf? A face like thine beheld I never. 
I yield myself unto the devil, Deliver, if I are not a devil myself. Thy head is out of order, sadly. It much becomes thee to be raving madly. Just think, the pocket of a priest should get the trinklets left for Margaret. The mother saw them, and instant a secret dread began to haunt her. Keen sand has she for tainted air. She snuffs within her book of prayer, and smells each article to see if sacred or profane it be. So here she guessed, from every gem, that not much blessing came with them. My child, she said, ill-gotten good and snares the soul, consumes the blood. Before the mother of God we will lay it, with heavenly manna she will repay it. But Margaret thought with sore grimace, a gift ours is not out of place. And truly godless cannot be the one who brought such things to me. A parson came, by the mother bidden. He saw at once where the game was hidden, and viewed it with a favour still thee. He spake, that is the proper view, who overcometh we net do. The holy chair says a stomach healthy, had eaten many a land as for feet, and never yet complained of so feet. The church alone, beyond all question, has for ill-gotten goods the right digestion. A general practice is the same which Jew and king may also claim. Then beg the spangles, chains, and rings, as if but toadstools were the things, and thanked no less and thanked no more than if a sack of nuts he bore, promised them fullest heavenly pay, and deeply edified were they. And Margaret? sits unrestful steel, and knows not what she should or will, thinks on the jewels day and night, but more on him who gave her such delight. The darling's sorrow gives me pain. Get thou a set for her again. The first was not a great display. Oh, yes, the gentleman finds it all child's play. Fix and arrange it to my will, and on her neighbour try thy skill. Don't be a devil stiff as paste, but get fresh jewels to her taste. Yes, gracious sir, in all obedience. Exit Faust. Such an enamoured fool in air would blow, sun, moon, and all the starry legions, to give his sweetheart a diverting show. Exit. Scene ten. The neighbour's house. Martha, Solus. God forgive my husband, yet he hasn't done his duty by me. Off in the world he went straightway, left me lie in the straw where I lay. And truly I did not fret him. God knows I loved and can't forget him. <laughs> she weeps. Perhaps he's even dead. Ah, oh, woe, had I a certificate to show. Margaret comes. Day, Martha. Margaret, what's happened thee? I scarce can stand, my knees are trembling. I find a box, the first resembling within my press, of ebony and things, all splendid to behold, and richer far than were the old. You mustn't tell it to your mother. T'would go to the priest, as did the other. Ah, uh, look and see, just look and see. Martha, adorning her. Oh, what a blessed luck for thee! But, ah, in the streets I dare not bear them, nor in the church be seen to wear them. Yet thou canst often this way wander, and secretly the jewels don. Walk up and down an hour before the mirror yonder. We'll have our private joy therein, and then a chance will come, a holiday, when piece by piece can one the things abroad display. A chain at first, then other ornament. Thy mother will not see, and stories will invent. Whoever could have bought me things so precious, that something's wrong, I feel suspicious. A knock. Good heaven, my mother can that have been? Martha, peeping through the blind. Tis some strange gentleman. Come in. Mephistopheles enters. Dad, I so boldly introduce me. I beg you, ladies, to excuse me. Steps back reverently on seeing Margaret. For Martha Swetlin, I would inquire. I'm she. What does the gentleman desire? Mephistopheles aside to her. It is enough that you are she. You have a visitor of high degree. 
pardon the freedom I have taken. Will afternoon return again. Martha, aloud. Of all things in the world, just here, he takes thee for a lady, dear. I am a creature young and poor. The gentleman's too kind, I'm sure. The jewels don't belong to me. Ah, not alone the jewellery. The look, the manner, both betray. Rejoiced am I that I may stay. What is your business, I would fain? I would I had a more cheerful strain. Take not unkindly its repeating. Your husband is dead, and sends a greeting. Is dead? Alas, that heart so true! My husband dead! Let me die too! Ah, dearest dame, let not your courage fail. Hear me relate the mournful tale. Therefore I'd never love, believe me. A loss like this to death would grieve me. Joy follows woo, woo after joy comes flying. Relate his life sad close to me. In Padua buried he is lying, beside the good Saint Anthony, within a grave well consecrated, for cool eternal rest created. He gave you further no commission? Yes, one of weight, with many shies, three hundred masses by, to save him from perdition. My hands are empty otherwise. What? Not a pocket piece? No jewellery? What every journeyman within his wallet spares, and as a token with him bears, and rather starves or begs than loses? Madam, it is a grief to me, yet on my word, his cash was put to proper uses. Besides, his penitence was very sore and lamented his ill fortune all the more. Alack, that men are so unfortunate. Surely for his soul's sake full many a prayer I'll proffer. You well deserve a speedy marriage offer. You are so kind, compassionate. Oh no, as yet it would not do. If not a husband, then a beau for you. It is the greatest heavenly blessing to have a dear thing for one's caressing. The country's custom is not so. Custom or not, it happens though. Continue, pray. I stood beside his bed of dying. It was something better than manure, half rotten straw, and yet he died a Christian sure. And found that heavier scores to his account were lying. He cried, I find my conduct wholly hateful, to leave my wife my tread in manner so ungrateful. Oh, the remembrance makes me die. Would of my wrong to her I might be shriven. Martha, weeping. The dear good man, long since was he forgiven. Yet see, God knows, was more to blame than I. He lied? What? On the brink of death he slandered? In the last throes his senses went, if by such things but half can judge. He said, I had no time for play for gaping freedom, first children, and then walk for bread to feed them, for bread in the widest sense to drudge, and could not even eat my share in peace and quiet. Had he all love, all faith forgotten in his riot, my work and worry day and night? Not so, the memory of it touched him quite, said he, when I from Malta went away. My prayers for wife and little ones were jealous, and such luck from heaven befell us. We made a Turkish merchantman our prey, that to the Sultan bore a mighty treasure. Then I received, as was most fit, since bravery was paid in fullest measure, my well-apportioned share of it. Say how? Say where? If buried, did he own it? Who knows now? whether the four winds have blown it. A fair young damsel took him in her care, as he in Naples wandered round unfriended, and see much love much fate to him did bear, so that he felt it till his days were ended. The villain, from his children thieving, even all the misery on him cast could not prevent his shameful way of living. But see, he is dead therefrom at last. Were I in your place, do not doubt me, 
I would mourn him decently a year, and for another keep meanwhile my eyes about me. Ah, oh God, another one so dear as was my first, this world will hardly give me. There never was a sweeter fool than mine. Only he loved to roam and leave me, and foreign wenches and foreign wine, and the damned throw of dice indeed. Well, well, that might have done. However, if he had only been as clever, and treated your slips with as little heed, I swear, with this condition too, I would myself change rings with you. The gentleman is pleased to jest. I will cut away betimes from here. She would take the devil at his word, I fear. To Margaret. How fears the heart within your breast? What means the gentleman? Aside. Sweet innocent thou art. Aloud. Ladies, farewell. Farewell. A moment ere we part. I'd like to have a legal witness. Where, how, and when he died to certify his fitness. Irregular ways I've always hated. I want his death in the weekly paper stated. Yes, my good dame. A pair of witnesses, always the truth establishes. I have a friend of high condition who will also add his deposition i will bring him here good sir pray do and this young lady will be present too a gallant youth has travelled far ladies with him delighted are before him i should blush ashamed before no king that could be named behind the house in my garden then this eve will expect the gentleman. Scene 11. A street. Faust. How is it? Under way? And soon complete? Mephistopheles. Ah, bravo. Do I find you burning? Well, Margaret soon will steal your yearning. At neighbor Martha's you will this evening meet. A fitter woman never was made To ply the pimp and gypsy trade. Tis well. Yet something is required from us. One service pays the other thus. We have but to make a deposition valid That now her husband's limbs, outstretched and pallid, At Padua rest, in consecrated soil. Most wise, and first, of course, we'll make the journey thither. Sancta Simplicitas, no need of such a toil. Depose with knowledge or without it either. If you've not better, then I'll tear your pretty plan. Now, there you are, O oh holy man. Is it the first time in your life you are driven to bear false witness in a case? Of God, the world, and all that in it has a place. Of man, and all that moves the being of his race. Have you not terms and definitions given, with brazen forehead, daring breast? And if you will probe the thing profoundly, knew you so much, and you will confess it roundly, as here of Swartlin's death and place of rest. Thou art, and thou remainst, a sophist liar. Yes, knew I not more deeply thy desire. For wilt thou not no lover fairer, poor Margaret flatter? and ensnare her, and all thy soul's devotion swear her. And from my heart. It is very fine, thine endless love, thy fate assuring, to one almighty force enduring. Will that too prompt this heart of thine? Hold, hold, it will. If such my flame, and for the sense and power intense I seek, and cannot find a name, then range with all my senses through creation, craving the speech of inspiration, and call this ardor so supernal, endless, eternal, and eternal. Is that a devilish lying game? And yet I am right. Mark this, I beg of thee, and spare my lungs henceforth. Whoever intends to have the right, if but his tongue be clever, will have it certainly. But come, 
the further talking brings disgust. For thou art right, especially since I must. Scene 12. Garden. Margaret on Faust's arm. Marta and Mephistopheles walking up and down. I feel the gentleman allows for me, demeans himself and shames me by it. A traveller is so used to be kindly content with any diet. I know too well that my poor gossip can never entertain such an experienced man. A look from thee, a word more entertains than all the lore of wisest brains. He kisses her hand. Don't incommode yourself. How could you ever kiss it? It is so ugly, rough to see. What work I do. How hard and steady is it? Mother is much too close with me. They pass. And you, sir, travel always, do you not? Alas, the trade and duty are so hairy. With what a pang one leaves so many as part, and dares not even now and then to tarry. In young, wild years it suits your ways, this round and round the world in freedom sweeping, but then come on the evil days, and so as bachelor into his grave a-creeping, none ever found a thing to praise. I dread to see how such a fate advances. Then, worthy sir, improve betimes your chances. They pass. Yes, out of sight is out of mind. Your courtesy and easy grace is. But you have friends in other places, and sensibler than I you'll find. Trust me, dear heart. What men call sensible is oft mere vanity and narrowness. How so? Ah, that simplicity and innocence ne'er know themselves, their holy value and their spell. That meekness, lowliness, the highest graces, which nature portions out so lovingly. So you but think a moment's space on me. All times I'll have to think of you, all places. No doubt you're much alone. Yes, for our household small has grown, yet must be cared for, you will own. We have no maid, I do the knitting, sewing, sweeping, the cooking, early work, and late in fact. And mother, in her notions of housekeeping, is so exact. Not that she needs so much to keep expenses down. We, more than others, might take comfort rather. A nice estate was left us by my father. A house, a little garden near the town. But now my days have less of noise and hurry. My brother is a soldier. My little sister's dead. True, with the child a troubled life I led, yet I would take again, and willing, all the worry. So very dear was she. An angel, if like thee. I bought it up, and it was fond of me. Father had died before it saw the light, a mother's case seemed hopeless quite. So weak and miserable she lay, and she recovered then so slowly, day by day. She could not think herself of giving, the poor wee thing, its natural living. And so I nursed it all alone, with milk and water, twas my own, lulled in my lap with many a song. It smiled and humbled and grew strong. The purest bliss was surely then thy dower. But surely also many a weary hour. I kept the baby's cradle near my bed at night, if it even stirred I'd guess it. And waking here, and I must nurse it warm beside me press it, and oft to quiet it my bed forsake and dandling back and forth the restless creature take, then at the wash-tub stand at morning's break, and then the marketing and kitchen tending, day after day the same thing, never ending. One spirit, sir, are thus not always good, but then one learns to relish rest and food. They pass. Yes, the poor women are bad off, tis true. A stubborn bachelor, there's no converting. It but depends upon the like of you and I should turn to better ways than flirting. Speak plainly, sir. Have you no one detected? Has not your heart been anywhere subjected? The proverb says, one's own warm heart and a good wife are gold and jewels worth. I mean, have you not felt desire, though ne'er so slightly? I have everywhere, in fact, been entertained politely. I meant to say, 
Were you not touched in earnest ever? One should allow oneself to jest with ladies never. Ah, uh, you don't understand. I am sorry I am so blind, but I am sure that you are very kind. They pass. And me, thou angel, didst thou recognize, as through the garden gate I came? Did you not see it? I cast down my eyes. And thou forgivest my freedom, and the blame to my impertinence befitting, as the cathedral thou wert quitting? I was confused. The like now happened to me. No one could ever speak to my discredit. Ah, thought I, in my conduct has he read it, something immodest or unseemly free. He seemed to have the sudden feeling that with this wench twere very easy dealing. I will confess I knew not what appeal on your behalf here in my bosom grew, but I was angry with myself to feel that I could not be angrier with you. Sweet darling. Wait a while. She plucks a star flower and pulls off the leaves one after the other. Shall that a nosegay be? No, it is just in play. How? Go. You'll laugh at me. She pulls off the leaves and murmurs. What murmurest thou? Half aloud. He loves me. He loves me not. Thou sweet angelic soul. Margaret continues. Loves me not. Loves me not. Plucking the last leaf, she cries with frank delight. He loves me. Yes, child. And let this blossom word for thee be speech divine. He loves thee. Ah, knowest thou what it means? He loves thee. He grasps both her hands. I'm all a tremble. Oh, tremble not, but let this look, let this warm clasp of hands declare thee what is unspeakable, to yield one wholly, and to feel a rapture in yielding. That must be eternal. Eternal, for the end would be despair, no, no, no ending, no ending. Marta coming forward. The night is falling. Aye, we must away. I'd ask you longer here to tarry, but evil tongues in this town have full play. It's as if nobody had nothing to fetch and carry, nor other labor, but spying all the doings of one's neighbor. And one becomes the talk, do whatsoever one may. Where is our couple now? Flown up the alley yonder, the willful summer birds. He seems of her still fonder. And she of him. So runs the world away. End of scene 12. End of section. Scenes 13 to 19 of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part 1, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Bayard Taylor. Scene 13, A Garden Arbor. Margaret comes in, conceals herself behind the door, puts her finger to her lips and peeps through the crack. He comes! Faust, entering. Ah, rogue! A tease thou art! I have thee! He kisses her. Margaret, clasping him and returning the kiss. Dearest man, I love thee from my heart. Mephistopheles knocks. Faust, stamping his foot. Who's there? A friend! A beast! It is time to separate. Marta, coming. Yes, sir, tis late. May I not then upon you wait? My mother would farewell. Ah, can I not remain? Farewell. Adieu. And soon to meet again. Exeunt Faust and Mephistopheles. Dear God, however is it such a man can think and know so much? I stand ashamed and in amaze and answer yes to all he says. A poor unknowing child. And he, I can't think what he finds in me. Exit. Scene 14. 
Forest and Cavern. Faust, Solus. Spirit sublime, thou gavest me, gavest me all for which I prayed. Not unto me in vain hast thou thy countenance revealed in fire. Thou gavest me nature as a kingdom grand, with power to feel and to enjoy it. Thou not only cold, amazed acquaintance yieldst, but grantest that in her profoundest breast I gaze as in the bosom of a friend. The ranks of living creatures thou dost lead before me, teaching me to know my brothers in air and water and the silent wood. And when the storm in forests roars and grinds, the giant firs in falling, neighbor boughs and neighbor trunks with crushing weight bear down, and falling fill the hills with hollow thunders, then to the cave secure thou leadest me. Then showest me mine own self, and in my breast the deep mysterious miracles unfold. And when the perfect moon before my gaze comes up with soothing light, around me float from every precipice and thicket damp the silvery phantoms of the ages past, and temper the austere delight of thought. That nothing can be perfect unto man, I now am conscious. With this ecstasy, which brings me near and nearer to the gods, thou gavest the comrade whom I now no more can do without, though cold and scornful he demeans me to myself, and with a breath, a word, transforms thy gifts to nothingness. Within my breast he fans a lawless fire, unwearied for that fair and lovely form. Thus in desire I hasten to enjoyment, and in enjoyment pine to feel desire. Mephistopheles enters. Have you not led this life quite long enough? How can a farther test delight you? It is very well that once one tries the stuff, but something new must then require to you. Would there were other work for thee? To plague my day auspicious thou returnest. Well, I'll engage to let thee be. Thou darest not tell me so in earnest. The loss of thee were truly very slight. Comrade crazy, rude, repelling. One has one's hands full all day and night. If what one does or leaves undone is right. From such a face as thine there is no telling. There is again thy proper tone. That thou hast bored me, I must thankful be. Poor son of art, how could thou thus alone have led thy life bereft of me? I, for a time at least, have worked thy cure. Thy fancy's rickets plague thee not at all. Had I not been, so hadst thou sure, walked thyself off this artly ball. Why here to caverns, rocky hollows slinking? Seest thou, as it were an owl a-blinking? Why suck'st from sodden moss and dripping stone, Toad-like, thy nourishment alone? A fine way this thy time to fill, The doctor is in thy body still. What fresh and vital forces canst thou guess Spring from my commerce with the wilderness? But if thou hadst the power of guessing, thou wouldst be devil enough to grudge my soul the blessing. A blessing drawn from supernatural fountains, in night and dew to lie upon the mountains. All heaven and art in rapture penetrating, thyself to godhood hoftily inflating, to grub with yearning force through art's dark marrow, compress the six days' work within thy bosom narrow. To taste I know not what in hofty power, Thine own ecstatic life on things shower, Thine earthly self behind thee cast, And then the lofty instinct does. With a gesture. At last, I dare not say how, To pluck the final flower. Shame on thee! Yes, thou findest that unpleasant, Thou hast the moral right to cry me shame at present. One dares not that before chest years declare, Which chest hearts notwithstanding cannot spare. And once for all I grudge thee not the pleasure Of lying to thyself in moderate measure. 
but such a course thou wilt not long endure. Already art thou overexcited, and if it last, wilt soon be plighted to madness and to horror sure. Enough of that, thy love sits lonely yonder, by all things sudden and oppressed, her thoughts and yearnings seek thee tender or fonder, my love is in her breast. First came thy passion's flood and poured around her, as when from melted snow a streamlet overflows, thou hast a dear it so filled and drowned her, that now thy stream all shallow shows. Methinks, instead of in the forest's lording, the noble sir should find it good, the love of this young silly blood at once to set about rewarding. Her time is miserably long. She haunts her window, watching clouds that stray over the old city wall and far away. Where I a little bird, so runs her song, day long and half night long. Now she is lively, mostly sad. Now wept beyond her tears. Then again quiet she appears. Always love mad. Serpent! Serpent! Mephistopheles aside. Ha! Ah, do I trap thee? Get thee away with thine offences, reprobate. Name not that fairest thing, nor the desire for her sweet body bring again before my half-distracted senses. What wouldst thou, then? She thinks that thou art flown, and half and half thou art, I own. Yet am I near, and love keeps watch and ward. Though I were ne'er so far, it cannot falter. I envy even the body of the Lord, the touching of her lips before the altar. It is very well, my envy oft reposes on your twin pair that feed among the roses. Away, thou pimp! You rail, and it is fun to me. The god who fashioned youth and maid perceived the noblest purpose of his trade, and also met dear opportunity. Go on, it is you profound. It is for your sweetheart's room you are bound, and not for that indeed. What are within her arms the heavenly blisses? Though I be glowing with her kisses, do I not always share her need? I am the fugitive, all houseless roaming, the monster without air or rest, that like a cataract, down rocks and gorges foaming, leaps maddened into the abyss's breast, and sideward she, with young unwakened senses, within her cabin on the alpine field, her simple homely life commences, her little world therein concealed. And I, God's hate flung o'er me, had not enough to thrust the stubborn rocks before me and strike them into dust. She in her peace I yet must undermine. Thou, hell, hast claimed this sacrifice as thine. Help, devil, through the coming pangs to push me. What must be, let it quickly be. Let fall on me her fate, and also crush me. One ruin whelm both her and me. Again it seeds, again it glows. Thou fool, go in and comfort her. When such a head as thine no outlet knows, It thinks the end must soon occur. Hail him who keeps a steadfast mind. Thou else dost well the devil nature wear. Not so insipid in the world I find, As is a devil in despair. Scene 15. Margaret's Room. Margaret at the spinning wheel, alone. My peace is gone. My heart is sore. I never shall find it. Ah, never more, save I have him near. The grave is here. The world is gall and bitterness all. My poor weak head is racked and crazed. My thought is lost, my sense is mazed. My peace is gone, my heart is sore, I never shall find it, ah, never more, To see him, him only, at the pain I sit, To meet him, him only, the house I quit. His lofty gait, his noble size, The smile of his mouth, 
the power of his eyes, and the magic flow of his talk, the bliss in the clasp of his hand, and, ah, his kiss. My peace is gone, my heart is sore, I never shall find it, ah, never more. My bosom yearns for him alone, ah, dared I clasp him, and hold, and own, and kiss his mouth to heart's desire, and on his kisses, at last, expire. Scene 16. Martyr's Garden. Margaret. Promise me, Henry. Faust. What I can. How is't with thy religion, pray? Thou art a dear, good-hearted man, and yet I think dost not incline that way. Leave that, my child. Thou know'st my love is tender. For love, my blood and life would I surrender. And as for faith and church, I grant to each his own. That's not enough. We must believe thereon. Must we? Would that I had some influence. Then, too, thou honourest not the holy sacraments. I honour them. Desiring no possession. Tis long since thou hast been to mass or to confession. Believest thou in God? My darling, who shall dare, I believe in God, to say? Ask priest or sage the answer to declare, and it will seem a mocking play, a sarcasm on the asker. Then thou believest not? Hear me not falsely, sweetest countenance. Who dare express him, and who profess him, saying, I believe in him? Who, feeling, seeing, deny his being, saying, I believe him not? The all enfolding, the all upholding, folds and upholds he not thee, me, himself? Arches not there the sky above us? Lies not beneath us firm the earth? and rise not on us shining, friendly, the everlasting stars. Look I not eye to eye on thee, and feel'st not thronging to head and heart the force still weaving its eternal secret, invisible, visible, round thy life? Vast as it is, fill with that force thy heart, and when thou in the feeling wholly blessed art, call it then what thou wilt, Call it bliss, heart, love, God. I have no name to give it. Feeling is all in all. The name is sound and smoke, obscuring heaven's clear glow. All that is fine and good. To hear it so, much the same way the preacher spoke, only with slightly different phrases. The same thing in all places, all hearts that beat beneath the heavenly day, each in its language say... Why then not I in mine as well? To hear it thus it may seem passable, and yet some hitch in there must be, for thou hast no Christianity. Dear love. I've long been grieved to see that thou art in such company. How so? The man who with thee goes, thy mate, within my deepest innermost soul I hate. In all my life there's nothing has given my heart so keen a pang of loathing as his repulsive face has done. Nay, fear him not, my sweetest one. I feel his presence like something ill. I've else for all a kindly will. But much as my heart to see thee yearneth, the secret horror of him returneth. And I think the man a knave as I live. If I do him wrong, may God forgive. There must be such queer birds, however. Live with the like of him may I never. When once inside the door comes he, he looks around so sneeringly, and half in wrath one sees that in nothing no interest he hath. "'Tis written on his forehead that love, to him, is a thing abhorred. "'I am so happy on thine arm, so free, so yielding, and so warm, "'and in his presence stifled seems my heart. "'Foreboding angel that thou art. "'It overcomes me in such degree that wheresoever he meets us even, "'I feel as though I'd lost my love for thee. "'When he is by, I could not pray to heaven, "'that burns within me like a flame. "'And surely, Henry, tis with thee the same.' There now is thine antipathy. But I must go. Ah, shall there never be a quiet hour to see us fondly plighted with breast to breast and soul to soul united? Ah, if I only slept alone, I'd draw the bolts to-night for thy desire. But my mother's sleep so light has grown, and if we were discovered by her, t'would be my death upon the spot. Thou angel, fear it not. 
here is a vial. In her drink but three drops of it measure, and deepest sleep will on her senses sink. What would I not to give thee pleasure? It will not harm her when one tries it. If it would, my love, would I advise it? Ah, dearest man, if but thy face I see, I know not what compels me to thy will. So much have I already done for thee, that scarcely more is left me to fulfil. Enter Mephistopheles. Exit. Margaret. Mephistopheles. The monkey is she gone. Hast played the spy again? I have heard how fully she drew thee. The doctor has been catechized, it is plain. Great good, I hope, the thing will do thee. The girls have much desire to ascertain, if one is prim and good, as ancient rules compel. If there he is led, they think he will follow them as well. Thou monster, wilt nor see nor own how this pure soul, of faith so lowly, so loving and ineffable, the faith alone that her salvation is, with scruples holy pines, lest she hold as lost the man she loves so well? Thou, full of sensual, super-sensual desire, a girl by the nose is leading thee. Abortion, thou, of filth and fire. And then how masterly she reads physiognomy. When I am present, she is impressed. She knows not how. She in my mask a hidden sense would read. She feels that surely I am a genius now. Perhaps the very devil indeed. Well, well, tonight. What's that to thee? Yet my delight it will also be. Scene 17. At the Fountain. Margaret and Lisbeth with pictures. Lisbeth. Hast nothing heard of Barbara? Margaret. No, not a word. I go so little out. It's true, Sibylla said today. She's played the fool at last, there's not a doubt. Such taking on of airs. How so? It stinks. She's feeding too whene'er she eats and drinks. Ah. And so, at last, it serves her rightly. She clung to the fellow so long and tightly. That was a promenading, at village and dance parading. As the first they must everywhere shine. And he treated her always to pies and wine. And she made it to do with her face so fine. So mean and shameless was her behavior. She took all the presents the fellow gave her. T'was kissing and coddling on and on. So now, at the end, the flower is gone. The poor, poor thing. Dost pity her at that? When one of us at spinning sat, and Mother Knights ne'er let us out the door, she sported with her paramour. On the door bench, in the passage dark, the length of the time they'd never mark. So now her head no more shall lift, but do church penance in her sinner shift. He'll surely take her for his wife. He'd be a fool. A brisk young blade has room elsewhere to ply his trade. Besides, he's gone. That is not fair. If him she gets, why, let her beware. The boy shall dash her wreath on the floor, and will scatter shaft before her door. Exit. Margaret returning home. How scornfully I once reviled, when some poor maiden was beguiled. More speech than any tongue suffices. I crave to censure others' vices. Black as it seemed, I blackened still, and blacker yet was in my will and blessed myself and boasted high, and now a living sin am I. Yet all that drove my heart thereto, God was so good, so dear, so true. Scene 18. Don John. In a niche of the wall, a shrine with an image of the Marta Dolorosa, pots of flowers before it. Margaret, putting fresh flowers in the pots. Incline, O maiden, thou sorrow-laden. Thy gracious countenance upon my pain. The sword thy heart in with anguish smarting, Thou lookest up to where thy son is slain. Thou seest the father, thy sad sighs gather, And bear aloft thy sorrow and his pain. Ah, past guessing, beyond expressing, The pangs that wring my flesh and bone, Why this anxious heart so burneth, Why it trembleth, why it yearneth, knowest thou, and thou alone. 
where'er i go what sorrow what woe what woe and sorrow within my bosom aches alone and ah and sleeping i'm weeping 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 the heart within me breaks the pots before my window alas my tears did wet as in the early morning for thee these flowers i set within my lonely chamber the morning sun shone red i sat in utter sorrow already on my bed help rescue me from death and stain o maiden thou sorrow laden incline thy countenance upon my pain scene nineteen night street before margaret's door valentine a soldier margaret's brother when i have sat at some carouse where each to each his brag allows and many a comrade prays to me the pink of girls ride lustily with brimming glass that spilled the toast and elbows planted as in boast i sat in unconcerned repose and heard the swagger as it rose and stroking then my beard i'd say smiling the bumper in my hand each well enough in her own way but is there one in all the land like sister margaret good as gold one that to her can a candle hold cling clang here's to her went around the board he speaks the truth cried some in her the flower of the sex is found and all the swaggerers were dumb and now i could tear my hair with vexation and dash all my brains in desperation with turned up nose each scamp may face me with sneers and stinging taunts disgrace me and like a bankrupt debtor setting a chance dropped word may set me sweating yet though i thrash them all together i cannot call them liars either but what comes sneaking there to view if i mistake not there are two if he's one let me at him dry he shall not leave this spot alive how from the window of the sacristy upward the eternal lamp sends forth a glimmer that lessening sidewards fainter grows and dimmer till darkness closes from the sky the shadows thus within my bosom gather i'm like a sentimental tomcat rather that round the tall fire ladder sweeps and still thee then along the copping creeps quite virtuous with it all i come a little tevious and a little frolicsome i feel in every limb the presage forerunning the grain to all pauses night day after to-morrow brings its message and one keeps watch then with delight meanwhile may not the treasure risen be which there behind i glimmering see shall soon experience the pleasure to lift the cattle with its treasure i lately gave therein a squint so splendid lion dollars in it not even a jewel not a ring to deck therewith my darling girl i saw among the rest a thing that seemed to be a chain of pearl that's well indeed for painful is it to bring no gift when her i visit thou shouldst not find it so annoying would not return to be enjoying now while the sky leads forth its starry throng thou wilt hear a masterpiece no work completer i will sing her first a moral song the sure afterwards to cheat her sings to the scither what dost thou hear in daybreak clear katrina dear before thy lover's door beware the blame let's in a maid that out a maid departed nevermore the quaxing shun of such an one when one said is done good night to thee poor thing love's time is brief unto no thief be warm and leave but with the wedding ring valentine comes forward whom wilt thou lure god's element rat catching piper thou perdition to the devil first the instrument to the devil then the cursed musician the cedar is smashed for nothing more it is fading there's yet a skull i must be splitting to faust 
Sir Doctor, don't retreat, I pray. Stand by, I'll lead, if you will but tarry. Out with your speed, do not delay. You have but to lunge, and I will parry. Then parry that. Why not? It is light. That too. Of course. I think the devil must fight. How is it then? My hands are already lame. To Faust. Trust home. Jails. Oh, God! Now is the lover tame. But come away, it is time for us to fly. For there arises now a murderous cry. With the police it were easy to compound it. But here the penal code will sift and sound it. Exit with Faust. Martha at the window. Come out, come out! Margaret at the window. Quick, bring a light. Martha as above. They swear and storm, they yell and fight. Here lies one dead already, see. Martha coming from the house. The murderers, whither have they run? Margaret coming out. Who lies here? Tis thy mother's son. Almighty God, what misery. I'm dying. That is quickly said. And quicker yet tis done. Why howl, you woman, there? Instead, come here and listen, every one. All gather round him. Why, Margaret, see, still young thou art, but not the least bit shrewd or smart, thy business thus too slight. So this advice I bid thee heed, now that thou art a whore indeed. Why, be one then, outright. My brother, God, such words to me. In this game let our Lord God be. What's done's already done, alas. What follows it must come to pass. With one begin'st thou secretly, then soon will others come to thee, and when a dozen thee have known, thou art also free to all the town. When shame is born and first appears, she is in secret brought to light, and then they draw the veil of night over her head and ears. Her life, in fact, they're loath to spare her, but let her growth and strength display, she walks abroad unveiled by day, yet is not grown a whit the fairer. The uglier she is to sight, the more she seeks the day's broad light. The time I verily can discern when all the honest folk will turn from thee, thou jade, and seek protection as from a corpse that breeds infection. Thy guilty heart shall then dismay thee, when they but look thee in the face. Shalt not in a golden chain array thee, nor at the altar take thy place. Shalt not, in lace and ribbons flowing, make merry when the dance is going. But in some corner will betide thee, among the beggars and cripples hide thee. And so, though even God forgive, on earth a damned existence live. Commend your soul to God for pardon, that's you your heart with slander harden. Thou pimp most infamous, be still. Could I thy withered body kill, t'would bring for all my sinful pleasure forgiveness in the richest measure. My brother, this is hell's own pain. I tell thee, from thy tears refrain. When thou from honour didst depart, it stabbed me to the very heart. Now, through the slumber of the grave, I go to God as a soldier brave. Dies. End of scene 19. End of section. Scenes 20 and 21 of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part 1, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Bayard Taylor. Scene 20. Cathedral. Service, organ, and anthem. Margaret among much people, the evil spirit behind Margaret. How otherwise was it, Margaret, when thou, still innocent here to the altar, camest, and from the worn and fingered book thy prayers didst prattle, half sport of childhood, half God within thee? Margaret, 
where tends thy thought within thy bosom what hidden crime prayst thou for mercy on thy mother's soul that fell asleep to long long torment and through thee upon thy threshold who's the blood and stirreth not and quickens something beneath thy heart thy life disquieting with most foreboding presence woe woe would i were free from the thoughts that cross me drawing hither and thither despite me sound of the organ wrath takes thee the trumpet peals the graves tremble and thy heart from ashy rest to fiery torments now again requickened throbs to life would i were forth i feel as if the organ here my breath takes from me my very heart dissolved by the anthem i cannot breathe the massy pillars imprison me the vaulted arches crush me Air. hide thyself sin and shame stay never hidden air light woe to thee quisum miser tunc dicturus quem patronem rogaturus cum vixius tuus id securus they turn their faces, the glorified, from thee. The pure their hands to offer, shuddering, refuse thee. Woe! Quid sum miser tum dicturus. Neighbor, your cordial. She falls in a swoon. Scene 21. Valpurgis night. The Hart's Mountains. District of Schirke and Aelant. Dost thou not wish a broomstick teeth's assistance? The stardiest he goat I would gladly see. The way we take, our goal is yet some distance. So long as in my legs I feel the fresh existence, this knotted staff suffices me. What need to shorten so the way, along this labyrinth of vales to wander, then climb the rocky ramparts yonder, where from the fountain flings eternal spray, is such delight my steps would fain delay. The springtime stirs within the fragrant birches, and even the fir-tree feels it now. Should then our limbs escape its gentle searches? I notice no such thing, I vow. It is winter steel within my body. Upon my path I wish for frost and snow. How sadly rises, incomplete and ruddy, the moon's lone disk with its belated glow and light so dimly that as one advances at every step one strikes a rock or tree let us then use a jack-o'-lantern's glances i see one yonder burning merrily oh dear my friend i will levy thine attendance why waste so vainly thy resplendence be kind enough to light us up the steep will o the wisp my reverence i hope will be enable to curb my temperament unstable for zigzag courses we are wont to keep. Indeed, he would like mankind to imitate. Now in the devil's name go straight, or I'll blow out his being's flickering spark. You are the master of the house, I mark, and I shall try to serve you nicely. But then reflect, the mountain's magic mad today, and if a will-o'-the-wisp must guide you on the way, you mustn't take things too precisely. In alternating song we it seems have entered newly in the sphere of dreams enchanted do the bidding guide us truly that our feet be for us planted in the vaster days of spaces see them swiftly changing places trees on trees beside us trooping and the crags above us stooping and the rocky snouts outgrowing hear them snoring hear them blowing 
O'er the stones the grasses flowing, stream and stream, let seek the hollow. Here I noises, songs that follow, here I tender love petitions. Voices of those heavenly visions, sounds of hope of love and like, and the echoes like traditions of all this complaint and hollow. Who shoo nearer hover jay and screech owl and the plover ah they all awake and crying is the salamander pushes loaded the it through the bushes and the roots like serpents twisted through the sand and boulders toiling brightest weirdest links uncoiling to entrap us unresisted living knots and gnarls uncanny fill with polypus antennae for the wanderer mice are flying thousand colored herd wise hying through the moss and through the heather and the fireflies wink and darkle crowded swarms that soar and sparkle and in weltering as god gather tell me if we still are standing or if further we're ascending all is turning whirling blending trees and rocks with grinning faces wandering lights that spin in mazes still increasing and expanding grasp my scar with heart undaunted here a middle peak is planted, whence one see to it amaze, mammon in the mountain blaze. How strangely glimmers through the hollows a dreary light like that of dawn! Its exhalation tracks and follows the deepest gorges faint and wan. Here steam, there rolling vapour sweepeth, here burns the glow through film and haze. Now like a tender thread it creepeth, now like a fountain leaps and plays. Here winds away, and in a hundred divided veins the valley braids. There in a corner, pressed and sundered, itself detaches, spreads, and fades. Here gush the sparkles incandescent, like scattered showers of golden sand. But see, in all their height at present, the rocky ramparts blazing stand. Has not some mammon grandly lighted his palace for this festal night? It is lucky thou hast seen the sight. The boisterous guests approach that were invited. How raves the tempest through the air! With what fierce blows upon my neck tis beating! Under the old reaps of the rock retreating, Hold fast, lest thou be hurled down the abysses there. The night with the mist is black. Hark how the forests grind and crack. Hearken, the pillars are shattered. The evergreen palace is shaking, boughs are groaning and breaking. The tree trunks terribly thunder, the roots are twisting asunder. In frightfully intricate crashing, each on the other is dashing. And over their extreme gorges, the tempest whistles and surges. Here's the dull voices higher ringing, far away or nearer singing. Yes, the mountain side along sweeps an infuriate clamoring song. Witches in chorus. The witches ride the rope and stop. The stubble is yellow and green the crop. There gathers the crowd for carnival, for ear and sit over all. And so they go over stone and stop the witches and the butt. Voice one. Alone, old Babau is coming now. She rides upon a pharaoh sow. Witches chorus. Then honor to whom the honor is due. Dame Baba first to lead the crew. A tuffle sow and the mother thereon. Then follow the witches, every one. Which way comest thou hither? Voice two. O'er the Ilsen stone. I peeped at the owl in her nest alone. How she stared and glared. Betake thee to hell. Why so fast and so fell? She has scored and has flayed me. See the wounds she has made me. Witches chorus. The way is wide, the way is long. long. See, what, what, a what a wild and crazy throng. throng. The, the broom scratches, the fork it thrusts. The, the child is stifled, the mother bursts. Wizards semi chorus. As doth the snail in shell we crawl. Before us go the women all. When towards the devil's house we tread. 
woman's a thousand steps ahead. We do not measure with such care, woman in thousand steps is theft. But howsoe'er she hasten may, man in one leap has cleared the way. Voice one from above. Come on, come on, from rocky lake. Voice two from below. Aloft we'd fain ourselves betake, we've washed, and are as bright as ever you will, yet we're eternally sterile still. Both choruses, witches and wizards. The, the wind, wind is hushed, is hushed the, stars the stars shoot by, the dreary, dreary moon, moon forsakes, forsakes the sky. The, the magic notes, notes like, like spark on spark, drizzle whistling, whistling through the dark. dark. Voice two from below. Halt there! Who there? Voice one from above. Who calls from the rocky cleft below there? Voice two from below. Take me too, take me too. I'm climbing now three hundred years, and yet the summit cannot see among my equals I would be. Both choruses, witches and wizards. Bears, bears the broom and bears the stock, bears the fork and bears, bears the buck. Who cannot raise himself tonight is evermore a ruined white. Half witch below. So long I stumble ill bestead, and the others are now so far ahead. At home I've neither rest nor cheer, and yet I cannot gain them here. To cheer, to cheer the, the witch will sound the veil, a rag will answer for a sail. Each child whose ship, ship supplies, supplies, he ne'er will fly, who now not flies. Both choruses, witches and wizards. When round the summit rolls on height, then lower and on the ground alight, and far and wide the enterprise, with witch would swarms of wantonness. They settle down. They crowd and push, they roar and clatter, they whirl and whistle, pull and chatter, they shine and spit and stink and bark, that through each element we learn. Keep close, or we are parted in our time. Where art thou? In the distance. Here. What? While well, so far astray. Then how's right I must use and clear the way? Make room, square volant comes. Room, gentle rebel, room. Here, doctor, hold to me. In one jump we'll resume, and in your space and from the crowd be free. It is too much even for the like of me. Yonder, with special light, there is something shining clearer. Within those bushes I have a mind to see. Come on, we'll slip a little nearer. Spirit of contradiction, on, I'll follow straight. Tis planned most wisely if I judge aright. We climb the Brocken's top in the Valpurgis night, that arbitrarily here ourselves we isolate. But see what motley flames among the header. There is a lively club together. In smaller circles, one is not alone. Better the summit I must own. There fire and whirling smoke I see. They seek the evil one in wild confusion. Many enigmas there might find solution. But their enigmas also knotted be. Leave to the multitude their riot. Here will we house ourselves in quiet. It is an old transmitted trade that in the greater world the little walls are made. I see stark new the young witches congregate. The old ones veiled and hidden shrewdly. On my account be kind nor treat them rudely. The trouble is small, the fun is great. I hear the noise of instruments attuning, while dean yet one must learn to bear the croning. Come, come along, it must be, I declare. I'll go ahead and introduce thee there, thine obligation newly earning. That is no little space, what sayest thou, friend? Look yonder, thou canst scarcely see the end. A hundred fires along the ranks are burning. They dance, they chat, they cook, they drink, they court. Nowhere, just tell me, is there better sport? Wilt thou, to introduce us to the rebel, assume the part of wizard or of devil? I am mostly used, it is true, to go incognito. But on a gala day one may his orders show. The garter does not deck my suit. But honoured and at home is here the cloven foot. Perceives thou yonder snail? It cometh slow and steady, so delicately its feelers pry, that it hath scented me already. I cannot hear disguise me if I try. But come, we will go from this fire to a newer. I am the go-between, and thou the wooer. 
to some who are sitting around dying embers. Old gentlemen, why at the outskirts, enter. I'd praise you if I found you snuggly in the centre, with youth and revel round you like a jewel. You each at home are quite enough alone. General. Say, who would put his trust in nations? However, for them one may have worked and planned. For with the people, as with women, youth always has the upper hand. Minister. Then now too far from what is just and sage, I praise the old ones not unduly. When we were all in all, then truly, then was the real golden age. Parvenu. We also were not stupid either, and what we should not often did. But now all things have from their bases slid, just as we meant to hold them fast together. Author. Who now? A work of moderate sense will read. Such works are held as antiquate and mossy. And as regards the younger folk, indeed, they never yet have been so pert and saucy. Mephistopheles, who all at once appears very old. I feel that men are ripe for judgment day. Now for the last time I have the witch's hill ascended. Since to the lease my cask is drained away, the walls as well must soon be ended. Huckster witch. Ye gentlemen, don't pass me thus. Let not the chance neglected be. Behold my wares attentively. The stock is rare and various, and yet there's nothing I've collected. No shop on earth like this you'll find, which has not once sore hurt inflicted upon the world and on mankind. No daggers here that set not blood to flowing, no cup that hath not once within a healthy frame poured speedy death in poison glowing. No gems that have not brought a maid to shame, no sword but severed ties for the unwary, or from behind struck down the adversary. Gossip, the times thou badly comprehendest. What is done has happed, what haps is done. It were better if for novelties thou sendest. By such alone can we be won. Let me not lose myself in all this pother. This is a fair as never was another. The whirlpool swirls above. Thou art shoped thyself. Amazing to show. But who is that? Not her especially. It is Lilith. Who? Adam's first wife is she. Beware the lure within her lovely tresses, the splendid sole adornment of her hair, when she succeeds therewith a youth to snare, not soon again she frees him from her chesses. Those two, the old one with the young one sitting, they've danced already more than fitting. No rest to-night for young or old, they start another dance, come now let us take hold. Faust dancing with the young witch. A lovely dream once came to me. I then beheld an apple tree, and there two fairest apples shone. They lured me so I climbed thereon. Huckster witch. Apples have been desired by you since first in paradise they grew, and I am moved with joy to know that such within my garden grow. Dancing with the old one. A dizzy dreams once came to me. Therein I saw a cloven tree which had a yet as it was i fancied a old witch i offer here my best salute unto the knight with a cloven foot let him uh, prepare if him does not scare procto phantasmist accursed folk how dare you venture thus had you not long since demonstration that ghosts can't stand on ordinary foundation and now you even dance like one of us huckster witch dancing why does he come then to our ball dancing oh everywhere on him you fall when others dance he weighs the matter if he can't every step be chatter then tis the same as were the step not made but if you forwards go his ire is most displayed and you would whirl in regular gyration as he does in his dull old mill He'd show at any rate good will, especially if you heard and heeded his hortation. You still are here? Nay, tis a thing unheard. Vanish at once. We've said the enlightened word. 
The pack of devils by no rules is daunted. We are so wise, and yet is Tegel haunted. To clear the folly out, now have I swept and stirred. Twill ne'er be clean, why, tis a thing unheard. Then cease to bore us at our ball. I tell you, spirits, to your face, I give to spirit despotism no place. My spirit cannot practice it at all. The dance continues. Not will succeed, I see amid such revels, Yet something from a tour I always save, And hope, before my last step to the grave, To overcome the poets and the devils. He now will seat him in the nearest puddle, The soul is this, whereof he is most assured, And when upon his rump the leeches hang and fuddle, He will be spirits and of spirit cured. To Faust, who has left the dance, Wherefore forsakest thou the lovely maiden, That in the dance so sweetly sang? Ah, in the midst of it there sprang A red mouse from her mouth, sufficient reason. That is nothing. One must not so squim as be, So the mouse was not grey enough for thee. Who think of that in love's selected season? Then saw I... What? Mephisto, seest thou there, Alone and far, a girl most pale and fair. She falters on, her way scarce knowing, As if with fettered feet that stay her going. I must confess it seems to me As if my kindly Margaret were she. Let the thing be. All dance have evil drawn. It is a magic shape, a lifeless eidolon. Such the encounter is not good. Their blank sets stare benumbs the human blood. And one is almost turned to stone. Medusa's tale to thee is known. Forsooth the eyes they are of one whom, dying, No hand with loving pressure closed. That is the breast whereon I once was lying, The body sweet beside which I reposed. It is magic all, thou fool, said used so easily. Unto each man his love she seems to be. The woe, the rapture, so ensnare me, That from her gaze I cannot tear me, And strange around her fairest throat A single scarlet band is gleaming, No broader than a knife-blade seeming. Quite right, the mark I also note. Her head beneath her arms she will sometimes carry. It was Perseus lopped it, her old adversary. The gravest the same illusion steal. Come, let us mount this little hill. The praetor shows no livelier tear, and if they have not bewitched my sense, I verily say a theatre. What's going on? Servibilis. It will shortly recommence. A new performance. Tis the last of seven. To give that number is the custom here. Twas by a dilettante written, and dilettante in the parts appear. That now I vanish, pardon, I entreat you. As dilettante, I the curtain raise. When I upon the Blocksburg meet you, I find it good, for that is your proper place. End of scene 21. End of section. Scenes 22 to 25 of Faust. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Faust, Part One, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Bayard Taylor. Scene Twenty-Two, Walpurgis Night's Dream, Oberon and Titania's Golden Wedding, Intermezzo. Manager, Sons of Miding, rest today. Needless your machinery, misty vale and mountain grey. That is all the scenery. Herald. Let the wedding golden be, must fifty years be rounded, but the golden give to me when the strife's compounded. Oberon. Spirits, if you're here, be seen. Show yourselves delighted. Fairy king and fairy queen, they are newly blighted. Puck. Cometh Puck, and light of limb, whisks and whirls in measure, Come a hundred after him, to share with him the pleasure. Ariel Ariel's song is heavenly pure, His tones are sweet and rare ones. 
Though ugly faces he allure, yet he allures the fair ones. Oberon. Spouses, who would fain agree, learn how we were mated. If your pairs would loving be, first be separated. Titania. If Irwin's wife control, and the man berate her, take him to the northern pole, and her to the equator. Orchestra Tutti, Fortissimo. Snout of fly, mosquito bill, and kin of all conditions, frog and brass and cricket trill, these are the musicians. Solo. See the bagpipe on our track, tis the soplon bubble. Hear the schnicky schnicky schneck, through his nostrils double. Spirit just growing into form. Spider's foot and paunch of toad and little wings, we know em. A little creature twill not be, but yet a little poem. A little couple. Little step and lofty leap through honeydew and fragrance. You'll never mount the airy steep with all your tripping vagrance. Inquisitive traveler. Ispit masquerading play, see I with precision. Oberon, the beauteous fay, meets tonight my vision. Orthodox. Not a claw, no tail I see, and yet, beyond a cavil, like the gods of Greece, must he also be a devil. Northern artist. I only see with sketchy air some outlines of the tourney. Yet I be times myself prepare for my Italian journey. Purist. My bad luck brings me here, alas. How roars the orgy louder. And of the witches in the mass. But only two wear powder. Young witch, huckster witch. Powder becomes, like petticoats, a gray and wrinkled naughty. So I sit naked on my goat. And show a strapping body. Matron. We've too much tact and policy to rate with jibes a scolder. Yet young and tender though you be, I hope to see you molder. Leader of the band. Fly snout and mosquito bill. Don't swarm so round the naked. Frog in grass and cricket trill. Observe the time and make it. Weathercock. Towards one side. Society to one's desire. Brides only and the sweetest, and bachelors of youth and fire, and prospects the completest. Towards the other side. And if the earth don't open now, to swallow up each ranter, why then will I myself, I vow, jump into hell instanta. Zinis. Us as little insects see, with sharpest snippers footing, that our papa Satan we may honor as is fitting. Hennings. How, in crowds together massed, they are jesting shameless. They will even say at last that their hearts are blameless. Muser Jets Among this witch's revelry his way one gladly loses, and truly it would easier be than to command the muses. Ci devant, genius of the age. The proper folks one's talents laud. Come on, and none shall pass us. The Blocksburg has a summit broad, like Germany's Parnassus. Inquisitive Traveller Say, who's that stiff and pompous man? He walks with haughty paces. He snuffles all he snuffle can. He scents the Jesuits' traces. Crane Both clear and muddy streams for me are good to fish and sport in, and thus the pious man you see, with even devils consorting. Worldling. Yes, for the pious I suspect, all instruments are fitting, and on the Blocksburg they erect full many a place of meeting. Dancer. A newer chorus now succeeds, I hear the distant drumming, don't be disturbed, tis in the reeds the bittern's changeless booming. Dancing master. How each his legs in nimble trip lifts up and makes a clearance. The crooked jump, the heavy skip, nor care for the appearance. Good fellow. The rabble by such height are held to maim and slay delights them. As Orpheus liar, the brutes compelled, the bagpipe here unites them. Dogmatist. I'll not be led by any lure of doubts or critic cavils. The devil must be something, sure, 
or how should there be devils? Idealist. This once the fancy wrought in me is really too despotic. Forsooth, if I am all I see, I must be idiotic. Realist. This racking fuss on every hand, it gives me great vexation, and for the first time here I stand on insecure foundation. Supernaturalist. With much delight I see the play, and grant to these their merits, since from the devils I also may infer the better spirits. Skeptic. The flame they follow on and on, and think they're near the treasure. But devil rhymes with doubt alone, so I am here with pleasure. Leader of the Band. Frog in green and cricket trill, such dilettantes perdition. Fly snout and mosquito bill, each one's a fine musician. The adroit. Sans souci, we call the clan of merry creatures so then. Go afoot no more if we can, and on our heads we go then. The awkward. Once many a bit we sponged, but now God help us, that is done with. Our shoes are all danced out, we trow. We've but naked souls to run with. Willow the Wisps. From the marshes we appear where we originated, yet in the ranks at once we're here as glittering gallants rated. Shooting Star. Darting hither from the sky, in star and firelight shooting, crosswise now in grass I lie, who'll help me to my footing? The Heavy Fellows. Room. And round about us room, trod the nard of grasses. Spirits also, spirits come, and they are our bulky masses. Puck. Enter not so still fed quite, like elephant calves about one, and the heaviest weight to night be Puck himself, the stout one. Ariel. If loving nature at your back or mind the wings uncloses, Follow up my airy track to the Mount of Roses. Orchestra. Pianissimo. Cloud and trailing mist o'erhead are now illuminated, air and leaves and wind in reed, and all is dissipated. Scene 23. Dreary day. A field. In misery, in despair, long wretchedly astray on the face of the earth, and now imprisoned, that gracious ill-starred creature shut in a dungeon as a criminal, and given up to fearful torments, to this has it come, to this, treacherous contemptible spirit, and thou hast concealed it from me, stand then, stand, roll the devilish eyes wrathfully in thy head, stand and defy me with thine intolerable presence, imprisoned, in irretrievable misery, delivered up to evil spirits and to condemning, unfeeling man. And thou hast lulled me, meanwhile, with the most insipid dissipations, hast concealed from me her increasing wretchedness, and suffered her to get hopelessly to ruin. She's not the first. Dog! Abominable monster! Transform him, thou infinite spirit! Transform the reptile again into his dog-shape, in which it pleased him often at night to scamper before me, to roll himself at the feet of the unsuspecting wanderer, and hang upon his shoulders when he fell. Transform him again into his favorite likeness, that he may crawl upon his belly in the dust before me, that I may trample him, the outlawed underfoot. Not the first... Oh, woe, woe which no human soul can grasp, that more than one being should sink into the depths of this misery, that the first, in its writhing death agony under the eyes of the eternal forgiver, did not expiate the guilt of all others. The misery of this single one pierces to the very marrow of my life, and thou art calmly grinning at the fate of thousands. Now. We are already again at the end of our wits, where the understanding of you men runs wild. Why didst thou enter into fellowship with us? 
if thou canst not carry it out, wilt fly, and art not secure against dizziness. Did we trust ourselves upon thee, or thou thyself upon us? Gnash not thus thy devouring teeth at me, it fills me with horrible disgust. Mighty, glorious spirit, who hast vouchsafed to me thine apparition, who knowest my heart and my soul, why fetter me to the felon comrade who feeds on mischief and gluts himself with ruin? Hast thou done? Rescue her, or woe to thee. The fearfullest curse be upon thee for thousands of ages. I cannot loosen the bonds of the avenger, nor undo his balls. Rescue her. Who was it that plunged her into ruin? I or thou? Faust looks around wildly. Wilt thou grasp the thunder? Well, that it has not been given to you, miserable mortals, to crush to pieces the innocent respondent. That is the tyrant fashion of relieving oneself in embarrassment. Take me thither. She shall be free. And the danger to which thou wilt expose thyself. Know that the guilt of blood from thy hand still lies upon the town. Avenging spirits hover over the spot where the victim fell, and lie in wait for the returning murderer. That too from thee! Murder and death of a world upon thee, monster! Take me thither, I say, and liberate her! I will convey thee there, and hear what I can do. Have I all the power in heaven and on earth? I will becloud the jailer's senses, get possession of the key, and lead her forth with human hand. I will keep watch, the magic steeds are ready, I will carry you off. So much is in my power. Up and away! Scene 24 Night, open field. Faust and Mephistopheles speeding onward on black horses. What weave they there round the raven stone? I know not what they are brewing and doing. Soaring up, sweeping down, bowing and bending. A witch's guild. They scatter, devote, and doom. On, on. Scene 25. Dungeon. Faust with a bunch of keys and a lamp before an iron door. A shudder, long unfelt, comes o'er me. Mankind's collected woe o'erwhelms me here. She dwells within the dark, damp walls before me, and all her crime was a delusion, dear. What? I delay to free her? I dread once again to see her. On! My shrinking but lingers death more near. He grasps the lock. The sound of singing is heard inside. Margaret singing. My mother the harlot Who put me to death My father the violet Who eaten me hath Little sister so good Laid my bones in the wood In the damp moss and clay Then was I a beautiful bird of the wood Fly away, fly away Faust unlocking She does not dream her lover listens near that he the rattling chain, the rustling straw, can hear. He enters, hiding herself on the pallet. Woe, woe, they come, O oh, death of bitterness! Whispering. Hush, hush, the hour is come that frees thee. Throwing herself before him. Art thou a man, then pity my distress. Thy cries will wake the guards, and they will seize thee. He takes hold of the fetters to unlock them. On her knees. 
Who, headsman, unto thee such power over me could give? Thou art come for me at midnight hour. Have mercy on me. Let me live. Is not soon enough when morning chime has run? She rises. And yet I am so young, so young, and now death comes, and ruin. I too was fair, and that was my undoing. My love was near, but now he's far. Torn lies the wreath, scattered the blossoms are. Seize me not thus so violently. Spare me. What have I done to thee? Let me not vainly entreat thee. I never chanced in all my days to meet thee. Shall I outlive this misery? Now am I wholly in thy might. But let me suckle, first, my baby. I blissed it all this livelong night. They took to away, to vex me, maybe. And now they say I killed the child outright, and never shall I be glad again. They sing songs about me. Tis bad of the folk to do it. There's an old story has the same refrain. Who bade them so construe it? Falling upon his knees. Here lieth one who loves thee ever, the thraldom of thy woe to sever. Flinging herself beside him. O oh, let us kneel and call the saints to hide us, under the steps beside us, the threshold under, hell heaves in thunder, the evil one with terrible wrath, Seeketh a path, his prey to discover. Aloud. Margaret, Margaret. Attentively listening. That was the voice of my lover. She springs to her feet, the fetters fall off. Where is he? I heard him call me. I am free. No one shall enthrall me. To his neck will I fly, on his bosom lie. On the threshold he stood, and Margaret calling. Midst of hell's howling and noises appalling, Midst of the wrathful, infernal derision, I knew the sweet sound of the voice of the vision. Tis I. Tis thou. Oh, say it once again. Clasping him. Tis he, tis he. Where now is all my pain? The anguish of the dungeon and the chain. Tis thou, thou comest to save me. And I am saved. Again the street I see. Where first I looked on thee, And the garden, brightly blooming, Where I and Martha wait thy coming. Struggling to leave. Come, come with me. Delay now, so fain I stay, When thou delayest. Caressing him. Away now, if longer here thou stayest, We shall be made to dearly rue it. Kiss me, canst no longer do it. My friend, so short a time thou art missing, And hast unlearned thy kissing. Why is my heart so anxious on thy breast, Where once a heaven thy glances did create me, A heaven thy loving words expressed, And thou didst kiss as thou wouldst suffocate me? Kiss me, or I'll kiss thee. She embraces him. Ah, oh, woe! Thy lips are chill and still. How changed in fashion thy passion! Who has done me this ill? She turns away from him. Come, follow me, my darling, be more bold. I'll clasp thee soon with warmth a thousandfold, but follow now, tis all I beg of thee. Turning to him. And is it thou? Thou, surely, certainly. Tis I, come on. Thou wilt unloose my chain. And in thy lap wilt thou take me once again. How comes it that thou dost not shrink from me? Say, dost thou know, my friend, whom thou makest free? Come, come, the night already vanisheth. My mother have I put to death. I've drowned the baby born to thee. Was it not given to thee and me? Thee too, tis thou, it scarcely true doth seem. Give me thy hand. Tis not a dream, thy dear, dear hand. But, ah, uh, tis wet. Why, wipe it off. Methinks that yet there's blood thereon. Ah, oh God, what hast thou done? Nay, sheathe thy sword at last. Do not affray me. Oh, let the past be past. Thy words will slay me. No, no, 
thou must outlive us. Now I'll tell thee the graves to give us. Thou must begin to-morrow, the work of sorrow, the best place give my mother, then close at her side my brother, and me a little away, but not too very far, I pray, and here, on my right breast, my baby lay. Nobody else will lie beside me. Ah, within thine arms to hide me, that was a sweet and gracious bliss. But no more, no more can I attain it. I would force myself on thee and constrain it, and it seems thou repellest my kiss. And yet tis thou, so good, so kind to see. If thou feel'st it is I, then come with me. Out yonder. To freedom. If the grave is there, death lying in wait, then come, from here to eternal rest, no further step. No, no, thou goest away. O oh, Henry, if I could go. Thou canst, just will it, open stands the door. I dare not go, there's no hope any more. Why should I fly? They'll still my steps waylay. It is so wretched, forced to beg my living, And a bad conscience sharper misery giving. It is so wretched, to be strange, forsaken, And I'd still be followed and taken. I'll stay with thee. Be quick, be quick, save thy perishing child. Away, follow the ridge, up by the brook, Over the bridge, into the wood, to the left, Where the plank is placed, in the pool, seize it in haste, tis trying to rise, tis struggling still, save it, save it. Recall thy wandering will, one step and thou art free at last. If the mounted we had only passed, there sits my mother upon a stone. I feel an icy shiver. There sits my mother upon a stone, and her head is wagging ever. She beckons. She nods not, her heavy head falls o'er. She slept so long that she wakes no more. She slept while we were caressing. Ah, those were the days of blessing. Here words and prayers are nothing worth. I'll venture then to bear thee forth. No, let me go. I'll suffer no force. Grasp me not so murderously. I've done else, all things for the love of thee. The day dawns, dearest, dearest. Day? Yes, the day comes, the last day breaks for me. My wedding day it was to be. Tell no one thou hast been with Margaret. Woe for my garland. The chances are over, tis all in vain. We shall meet once again, but not at the dances. The crowd is thronging, no word is spoken. The square below and the streets overflow. The death bell tolls. The wand is broken. I am seized and bound and delivered. Shoved to the block. They give the sign. Now over each neck has quivered the blade that is quivering over mine. Dumb lies the world, like the grave. Oh, had I ne'er been born! Appears outside. Off, or you are lost here more. Useless talking, delaying, and praying. My horses are nigh. The morning twilight is near. What rises up from the threshold here? He, he, suffer him not. What does he want in this holy spot? He seeks me. Thou shalt live. Judgment of God, myself to thee I give. To Faust. Come, or I'll leave high the lodge and thee. Thine am I, Father. Rescue me. Ye angels, holy cohorts, guard me. Camp around and from evil ward me. Henry, I shudder to think of thee. She is judged. From above. She is saved. To Faust. Hither to me. He disappears with Faust, from within, dying away. Henry! Henry! 
End of scene 25. End of Faust, part one, by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Bayard Taylor.